Well, hello and welcome to Hearth and Home's OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is another round of Who Played It Better. So for tonight, we've got Philip Marlowe. And we're going to be looking at Van Heflin and Gerald Moore. 1947, NBC brought the new adventures of Philip Marlowe to the radio. The following year, the show moved to CBS as The Adventures of Philip Marlowe with Gerald Moore playing Marlowe. The show had a longer run on CBS, lasting for 114 episodes and running all the way to 1950. Then in 1951, it came back as a summer replacement for Hopalong Cassidy. And Moore would continue to play Marlowe except for one episode, The Anniversary Gift, which was voiced by William Conrad. Now, the last episode, when we did Boston Blackie, I did four episodes with Chester Morris, followed by four episodes with Richard Colmer. Tonight, I've got four episodes of each actor, but they're going back to back. So the first story is The Red Wind. And this one's interesting because both series started with this first episode. So we get to compare right away the two actors with the same story, same plot, and we can see who played it better. Well, make sure to let us know in the comments down below who you think played Philip Marlowe better. But just before we get into the action, I want to mention that Hearth and Home Entertainment is not an ad-supported channel. While YouTube is free, it does take a lot of time and money to keep a channel like this going. So we really appreciate your support. Help keep us on YouTube. If you would, take a minute to check out the links in the description below. Check out coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. And many of you have asked about using PayPal and coffee.com. The first option would be the best for you. Another great way you can support the channel is to check out the Hearth and Home Shop on Etsy. I've got a link for that down below as well. There you'll find a great assortment of old-time radio-themed goodies and maybe a Bigfoot shirt or two. But now, without any further ado, let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back and relax, let go of the cares of the day, step back from this modern world for a little bit as we travel back in time to 1947 and 1948 and enjoy the new adventures of Philip Marlowe and the adventures of Philip Marlowe starring Van Heflin and Gerald Moore and decide who played it better. And as always, thanks for tuning in. For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Pepsodent presents Philip Marlowe, Hollywood's famous private detective created by Raymond Chandler. Philip Marlowe, tough, cynical, private eye of Murder, My Sweet, the sardonic, case-hardened detective of the Brasher Doubloon, the Lady in the Lake, and the Big Sleep. You've seen him in action in all of those top-flight mystery pictures. Now, in order that you may continue to enjoy this exciting mystery series, Pepsodent brings you the adventures of Philip Marlowe on the air with a cast of noted radio players. And starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with Irium. New fresh tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. It's the three-to-one favorite over all other toothpastes. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three-to-one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with other toothpastes at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three-to-one over all other brands they tried. These families, three-to-one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Sanguis that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair, make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends up in a fight, and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. 
Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I opened the door and closed it from the outside and locked it and went out to get a beer before I went up to my apartment. Uh, fill her up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlowe. Marlowe. Marlin is a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey. Hey, you bartender. Give me another ride. That drunk again. What'd you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Make it snappy, you yeah? Be right with you, sport. I gotta draw this man a beer. Crying out loud, these stumble bums who come in here. You got another customer, Bacchus. Hey, bud. You seen a lady in here lately? A lady? Tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Nobody like that's been in. All right, straight scotch, fast. I left my engine running out there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This slick-looking, sarcastic guy stepped up to the bar and drank his scotch whole. And he stopped. The drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke curled. Very little. All right, you other guys. Don't move. So long, Waldo. All right, don't move, you two. Oh, Waldo. But I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. All right, get on that phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. Not too late. Drove away with this dead guy's car. Uh, maybe he ain't dead. Uh, he's dead, all right. Where's your phone? This is for the police. The prowl car boys were there in about five minutes. Waldo was out of business, all right. And nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's tall, brown-haired pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about nine o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a tall, brown-haired pretty girl in a bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. I said, excuse me, I'm in a hurry. Now, if you'll be good enough Look, to step out Look, you better not of... go outside in those clothes. Just what do you mean by telling me this what... This isn't a make. You're in trouble. Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you in those clothes. But I haven't done anything that... I'm in room 41 across the hall now. I never collected an etching in my life. All right, I'll go with you. I'll go. I got to my room and rustled up some scotch and soda and brought the girl her glass. She had a small automatic in her hand. It jumped up at me, and her eyes were full of panic. I put down both glasses on the table slowly so that I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, maybe this wind has got you crazy, too. Don't move. Careful, don't move. A man just got shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket, like yours. What did he look like, this man? Tall, 5'11", slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter, dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you earlier tonight to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? He used to be my chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? Why? Listen, he asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell them. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal? Fifteen thousand dollars. Oh, it's peanuts. But it wasn't the value. It meant something to me. The man I love gave it to me, and now he's dead. He was a flyer shot down over Germany. I'll go back and tell my husband that. He probably hired you. He did? Well, how much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. He's a hydroelectric engineer. I'll have you know that my husband oh, is one of... Oh, skip it. I'll take him out to lunch sometime and have him tell me himself. 
And about Waldo, whatever he had on you is dead stock now, like Waldo himself. You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, sister, he's dead. Dead, dead, dead. Lady, he is dead. Oh. I scream and I'll give you two black eyes. I'm not going to scream. Who will that be? There's a dressing room behind that door. Hide there. Don't now, don't argue with me, do it. All right. And I went to the door making a loud, yawning sound. The backs of my hands were wet. I opened the door. Without a gun, that was a mistake. I certainly knew the gun I was looking into, a 22 target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head and the flat, shiny eyes and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I, I backed into the room and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan pen. How is he? Dead. <laughs> I'm still good, drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeeper and me talking, and I... Told him my name, where I lived. That's how, pal. I said, why? Oh, skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. Oh, you're pretty tough at that, ain't you? But you're slamming off, pal. All right, but you could get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else. Oh, yeah, sure. Is this better? This suit you all right? Uh, just so it isn't my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun. The door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her iris. She, she was scared. She had her gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She'd try to make the door scream either way. It'd be curtains for both of us. You scared, mister? You worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy. And her horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Go on, say the word. Well, don't take all night about it if you're if you're going to do something about it. Why not, pal? I like this. I suppose I yell. Go ahead, yell. Go ahead. Put up yeah. your hands. Hey, the... look. <clears throat> Oh. Thanks, sister. Thanks. That that buys me. Everything I have is yours now and forever. Is he dead? You flatter me no end, lady. I only punched him. All right, now get out of here while I call the cops down on this killer. Yes. yes. Good night. Good hey, night. Hey, wait, wait. Leave that Bolero jacket here. It mocks you for the cops. Oh. Yes. Here. Okay. See you again? Why? Oh, I don't know. No, I guess not. After all, who am I to be the rival of a dead flyer? I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. Yeah? You mean me? Yes. Please. Oh, you, again, huh? Get in. I must talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters, huh? Yes. Well, I went down there with the law and gave them the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thank you. You saved my life, so no one knows a thing about you. Well, incidentally, neither do I. Well, my name is Mrs. Frank Bosley. 212 Fremont Place, Olympia 24596. Is that what you want? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, why did you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Pearls? Yes. Pearls, too. All right. Tell me about the pearls. 
We've had a murder and a beautiful mystery woman and a sadistic killer and a heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets and there weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? Well, it's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do in this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? He moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Mm, great, a sort of an amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, it's getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. You could have brought him along. You could have sat in the back seat working out a problem in hydroelectrics while... While what? Well, I didn't have any answers. They wouldn't sound cheap or just ridiculous or from the sophomore class in repartee. I had an unlit cigarette in my hand. I threw it out of the window. I took a hold of her and kissed her. <laughs> She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. I wasn't always that way. Only since Johnny Dalmas was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them perfectly matched with the diamond propeller clasp. I'd have loved them if they'd been wooden beads because he gave them to me. I love Johnny, the way you love just one time. You understand that? Hmm. What's your name? Lola. Lola, how did you explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband? I told him they were imitation, then I bought them myself. How did Waldo latch on to them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina, Waldo and I'd go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together, but that's all. But you confided in Waldo about this pearls. I was a fool. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you, or he'd tell Papa, huh? I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment? I suppose it's a lot to ask. No, sweetheart. Uh -uh. I've been paid. I'll go look. Wait here, huh? Has it gone along, Lola? No. Well? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. A man? Who? You know a man named Leon Valsanos? Not by name. I don't know. Mexican, South American, about uh, 45, small, iron gray hair, very neat, fawn-colored suit, wine-colored tie. No, I don't think I know such a man. Is he the one in Waldo's room? Yeah. What does he have to say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He's dead. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. It's the three-to-one favorite over all other toothpastes. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three-to-one. The Farrell family of Evergreen Park, Illinois, preferred new Pepsodent on every single count. The Farrells say, new Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer new Pepsodent over all other toothpaste they've tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Farrells and other families who compared new Pepsodent with other toothpaste they had at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay.
We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler and starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mare, producers of the Technicolor musical Fiesta, starring Esther Williams. I sat with Lola Barsley in her car listening to that jittery, infuriating desert wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling. Then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun in a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could use it. Someone? Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? It's been there for hours. It was there before I parked here to wait for you. Leon, the man in Waldo's room, came in that car, but according to the key containers he carried, that isn't his car. Whose car is it? Does it matter? Well, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the keys. A lady? Well, anyway, a woman, if you're going to split hairs. Eugenie Kolchenko. Hmm? In West Los Angeles? Never heard of it. Uh huh. All right, well, you go home now, huh? What are you going to do? Drive that flossy convertible around, wave at my friends, impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. Yes? What is it, please? Miss uh, Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes? What is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Now, don't be alarmed. I found it and I brought it home to you. Come in, please. It is a reward you wish. Shall we say... Snap out of it, dragon lady. Who was he? Who was who? The little guy, Leon. You loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? (gasps) Oh, Oh, no, no. Oh, yes, yes. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, honey? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? The gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead. Darling, he's dead. Well, that's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Mm, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Mm-hmm. You told the police yet? Never do at once. What can be deferred pending negotiations? Aesop. I might negotiate. Oh, peachy. What do you know, Marlowe? A man named Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happened to have the inside as to who he was. And when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leo Valsanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 in 20s on him, would he? No, but this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed at that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Hmm. Is there a basis there for negotiations yet? Very well, Marlowe. I'm a married man. There were certain unpaid bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But you told me I might charge to your account. All right, so I wasn't very bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the unpaid bill safely in my briefcase. Somehow this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon and gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's dough and was forced to kill Leon in the process. Then he went out to keep another date and accidentally walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down. And someone still has those bills. And I'm in for a divorce suit. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it. Yeah, that could be. The cops caught him. Oh. And the police have the briefcase. Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crime, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. Look, I've got a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me. Well, then that's what it'll cost you. Well, good luck. And, um, thank you, Mr., uh... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? My name is Frank Barsley. Bars... Barsley. Oh. What does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer? Yeah. How did you know? My voices tell me. Who? Darling, this man is manifestly insane. 
It's the heat, Miss Kochenk. It's the Santa Ana. It's the desert wind. May I use your telephone? Someday I must tell you about Ibera. Salt of the Earth, Ibera, Detective Lieutenant over at Central Homicide. I phoned Ibera from Miss Kochenko's house and told him where he could find a well dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibera time to check my tip, and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room, only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Well, I thought Waldo might have them up there. Mm -hmm. Whose pearls were they? A lady's. Go on. Or they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Mm, yeah. What, yeah? They might have. Also a batch of unpaid bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Barsley? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, now, the police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They, they want to prevent or to solve crime, right? So? So I've got $500 for the police fund if those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. <laughs> Quit your kidding. No, no, it's, it's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. That's it. Forty-one pearls, perfectly matched diamond propeller clasp. That's it. That's the one. Take it away, Mara. On the level? Mm -hmm. Just tell me straight what it's all about, all oh, I ask. Sure, sure. Well, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills. A guy by the name of Barsley. Well, Barsley sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo killed Leon, then stepped out and happened to get shot by that guy at the bar. Now, if Barsley's name stays out of the paper, I get $500. And that goes to the police fund. We'll keep him out. Well, now, I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. As you say, Morrow, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Well, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, she no, lives at... No, 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 Morrow. Uh, you better take them to her. You see, except for the diamond propeller clasp on them, they're, uh, they're phony. Phony, but... It... All but the clasp, Morrow. All but the clasp. Well, I stared at Ibera. So the flyer, Johnny Dalmas, the great lover, had given Lola a string of fake pearls. Well, I didn't know how to tell her, but I called her up and told her to meet me at the beachcombers at two. I was going to slip her the bad news slowly. I'm glad you asked me to meet you here, Mr. Marlow. See, I... I had to have someone to talk to. Go ahead. Go ahead, talk. I'm listening. Now, Mr. Marlow, now more than ever, I must... I must have those pearls. Why? Money trouble? Oh, no, no. It's just that everything's gone wrong. And this morning, my husband told me where to separate. Oh, I'm sorry, Lola. But if I had Johnny's pearls, it would be a link with the past and with Johnny. And all he meant to me. It's how a woman feels, Mr. Marlowe. I wouldn't blame you for not understanding. Well, maybe I do, though. So please, Mr. Marlowe, please. You'll try to find my pearls. Lola, look, I... Even I, if I, it I, isn't I, all of them. Any part of them. Any... Any single smallest one of them. It'll be Johnny's. Look, will you uh, meet me here again around 4 o'clock? I'll be here. Okay, I'll see what I can do. There was only one earthly decent thing I could do. I took Lola's glass pearls to a jeweler and I had him take off the diamond clasp and put it on one of those strings of so-called simulated pearls that they sell you for three bucks, tax included. And I went back to keep my four o'clock date with Lola at the beachcombers. Well, Mr. Marlowe, anything new? Yes, the uh, police found some pearls in Waldo's car. They found my pearls? No, no, not, not exactly. Not exactly? Well, Waldo was getting set to jip you, Lola. He had the diamond clasp of your necklace attached to a string of cheap imitations. And then he sold the real pearls. Oh, how... Oh. These are the imitations here. Yes. But it is my clasp. The clasp is real. Is that all right? Yes, it's the clasp that Johnny Dalmas gave me. Oh, of course, of course it's all right. Oh, that's swell. 
And thank you so much, Mr. Marlowe. Forget it. I won't. Not ever. Well, is this goodbye? Yeah, I think so. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas, Lola. If anybody ever bothers you again, though, well, let me know. Name's Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu and then I parked and walked out on a rock cliff jutting into the Pacific Ocean. Then I reached in my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. The gull swooped down on them and then flapped up again, screaming indignantly. The phony pearls had fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley, but they couldn't fool a seagull. I said to myself, to the memory of Johnny Dalmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once, I realized that the wind had died. The Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the first of a new mystery series, Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Have you tried, have you tasted the new Pepsodent toothpaste? Its lingering minty flavor is so fresh and inviting, families prefer it by an overwhelming average of three to one over all other toothpastes in a recent nationwide test. They said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, new Pepsodent gives you more invigorating irium foam. It sweeps dulling film away. No wonder it's the three-to-one favorite with families all over America. Get new Pepsodent with irium for your family right away. Tonight's story on the adventure of Philip Marlowe was based on Red Wind, written by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. It was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger. Heard with Van Heflin was Lorene Tuttle as Lola Barsley. And this is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at this same time to another exciting story on the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It was hot, boiling hot that night. I wanted to grab a beer and turn in early. So what happens? I get my beer, but with it comes a gunshot, a beautiful woman in trouble, and murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime mystery, CBS presents his most famous character, brought to you now in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, Red Wind. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Angeles that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I locked up and decided a nice cold beer would taste good before I went up to my apartment. Fill her up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlowe. Uh, Marlin. Yeah, Marlin's a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Marlin's also the name of a lady on the radio. Marlin, comma, Mary, the story of. Yeah, my wife listens to it. Yeah, oh, good for her. All right. Hey, you're a bartender. Another ride. Yeah, that drunk again. What do you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Make it sappy. You hear? Be right with you, sport. Gotta draw this man a beer. Crying out loud, these stumble bums. 
Hey, Bud. You got another customer, Backus. Uh, hey, Bud, you seen a lady in here lately? A lady? A tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, nobody like that, Spinning. All right, straight scotch fast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As the man drank, I noticed the drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke. Very little. You other guys, don't move. So long, Waldo. Don't move, you two. Poor Waldo. I bet I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. Get on the phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Too late. He drove away in the dead guy's car. Uh, maybe he ain't dead. No, he's dead all right. Oh. That guy was using a twenty-two target yeah. pistol. When they use that kind of gun, they don't make mistakes. Yeah. Where's your phone? This uh, is for the police. <laughs> Prowl car boys were there in five minutes. Waldo was out of business all right. Nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. And with that kind of heavy coin, you can buy a good 1910 automobile even today. Well, I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's brown head, pretty girl, and the bolero jacket. It was about 9 o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a brown head, pretty girl, in a bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. <laughs> What is I'm it? I'm a great admirer of Valero jackets. What? Now, take the one you've got on, for instance. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. No, 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 wait. If you'll be good enough to let me... Bu oh, you've made me miss the elevator. That's just as well. What? Well, it's better you don't go out in those clothes. What do you mean? Tall, good-looking, Valero jacket, blue silk dress. Mm-hmm. Lady, might I take the trouble of telling you that you're in trouble? Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you in those clothes. I haven't done anything. Maybe not. But if I were you, I'd have a little talk with me. Wait, well, then, I'm in no, room but... 41 across the hall. I know things about you. Well... Good girl. Come along. It took a firm grip on her arm, but I managed to get her to my room. I rustled up some drinks, but when I turned to give her hers, I... I saw she held a small automatic. She looked at me steadily. I put down both glasses slowly so I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, I, I, I know it's hot tonight and heat does funny things to people, but uh, let's put that little thing away and have a nice cool drink, huh? Don't move. Oh, I'm strictly frozen in my tracks. Stay that way. Okay, okay. But wouldn't you like to know that I'm a private detective? Private detective? Yeah, I can prove it if you'll let me. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I don't like those things pointed at me. I'll have that drink. Oh, good. I don't often give good liquor away like this. I can't afford it. Why are they after me? Well, a man was just shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket. What did he look like, this man? Oh, he was tall, about 5'11". Slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter. Dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you early at night to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? You used to be my... My chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? I... He asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell them. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal. Fifteen thousand dollars. Peanuts. But it wasn't the value. You see, it meant something to me. The man I loved gave it to me. And now he's dead. He shot down over Germany. Now go back and tell my husband that. He'll, he probably hired you. He did? How much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. He's a hydroelectric engineer. Never mind about him. What about Waldo? Why was he knocked off? You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, yeah, sister, he's dead, very dead. Oh. Screaming won't bring him back. I'm not going to scream. Who would that be? There's a dressing room behind the door. Hide there. Take your glass, will you? All right, all right. I went to the door, making 
making a loud yawning sound. Foolishly, I didn't have my gun. That was a mistake. Because when I opened the door, the guy on the other side certainly had one. A 22 target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head, the flat, shiny eyes, and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I backed into the room and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan Penn. How is he? Dead. <laughs> well, I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeep and me talking. I told him my name and where I lived. Oh. That's how, pal. I said, why? Skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. You're pretty tough at that, ain't you, pal? But you're slamming off. All right. But, uh, could you get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else? Just any place. This better? This suits you all right? Yeah, just so it isn't my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun weakly. Door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little in spite of the heat. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her irises. She was scared. She had a gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She tried to make the door a scream. Either way, it would be curtains for both of us. Scared, mister? Worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy. The horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Say the word. Well, don't take all night about it. If you're going to do something about it, do it. Why not, pal? I like this. Suppose I yell. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Put Go up ahead. Your hand. Hey, look. Oh. Oh. Thanks, sister. That buys me. Everything I have is yours, now and forever. Is he dead? You flatter me, no end, lady. I only punched him. Now get out of here while I call the yes. cops down on this killer. Yes. Good night. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That jacket marks you for the cops. Leave it here. You don't need it in this kind of weather. Oh, yes, here. Okay. See you again. Why? I don't know. Who might it be the rival of a dead flyer and things like that? Now, on second thought, forget the whole thing. I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. Yeah? You mean me? Yes, please. Oh. You again. Get in. I want to talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters? Yes. I went down to headquarters with the law and gave him the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you saved my life. So no one knows anything about you. Incidentally, neither do I. My name is Mrs. Frank Barsley. 212 Fremont Place. Olympia 24596. Is that what you wanted? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, why'd you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Oh, no. Pearls, too? Yes. All right, tell me about the pearls. <laughs> We've had a murder, a beautiful mystery woman, and a sadistic killer, and an heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets. There weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? It's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do, in this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? Well, he just moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Sort of amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, uh, getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. Good. 
Why did you say that? I didn't have any answers. We just sat there looking at one another. I was suddenly aware of the hot desert wind stirring up the night. I took hold of her and I kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. Oh, I wasn't always this way. Only since Johnny Dolmas was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them. With a diamond propeller clasp. I'd have loved them if they were wooden beads because he gave them to me. I love Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand that? Yes, I can. What I don't understand is how you could explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband. I told him they were imitation. That I bought them myself. How did Waldo latch onto them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina... Waldo and I would go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together. But that was all. But you confided in Waldo about those pearls. Yes. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you. He'd tell Papa. Oh, I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment. I suppose it's a lot to ask. I've been paid. Now go look. Wait here. Was I gone long, no. Lola? Well? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. Man? Who? You know a guy named Leon Velasanos? No, not by name. I don't know. Mexican, South American, about 45, small, iron-gray hair, very neat. Fawn-colored suit, wine-colored tie. No. I don't think I know such a man. You say he was in the room? Yeah. Well, what did he say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He was dead. You are listening to the adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by one of America's most outstanding writers of crime and mystery fiction, Raymond Chandler. Our story for today, The Red Wind, continues in just a moment. But first, a message of interest for all young men. How would you like to be up there in the wild blue sky, flying America's mightiest bombers, fastest fighters, and newest jet jobs? Believe me, it's a great feeling to know that you have the skill, the courage it takes to become a pilot officer in the United States Air Force, the Air Force that's second to none. Keep your eye on the local newspapers and your nearest Army Air Force recruiting station. An aviation cadet recruiting team will be in your community soon. If you're between the ages of 20 and 26 and a half years of age, single and a high school graduate, plan to see the Aviation Cadet Interviewing Team. If you pass the mental and physical examination, you'll be accepted for the 52-week Aviation Cadet Training Program. When you graduate, you'll be a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force, the mightiest of all. And now, back to the adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Bohr as our star, we continue today's adventure. I sat with Lola Bosley in her car, listening to the hot wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling, and then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun in a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could set up in business with a gun. Someone? You mean Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? Oh, it's been there for hours there before I parked here to wait for you. Well, Leon, the guy in Waldo's room, came in that car. But according to the key container he carried, it isn't his car. Well, whose car is it? Does it matter? Yeah, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the car keys. Eugenie Kolchenko, West Los Angeles. I've never heard of her. Mm-hmm. Well, you better go home now. What are you going to do? I'll drive that flossy convertible around and wave at my friends. Impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. Hmm. 
Yes. What is it, please? Miss Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes. What is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Oh, don't be alarmed. I found it, brought it home to you. Oh, come in, please. Uh, it is a reward you wish. Shall we Snap say... Snap out of a dragon, lady. Who was he? Who was who? A little guy, Leon. You loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? Oh, no. No. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, my dear? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? Well, the gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead, darling. He is dead. That's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Yeah, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Hmm. Have you told the police yet? Never do at once what can be profitably deferred pending negotiation. Aesop. I might negotiate. Peachy. Just what do you know, Marlowe? Well, a man named Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happen to have the insight as to who he was, and when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leon Velasanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 and 20s on him, would he? No. But this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed in that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Mm. Is there a basis for negotiation yet? Very well, Marlowe. There were certain bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But, darling, you told me I might charge to your account. All right, my dear, so I wasn't bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the bills safely in my briefcase. Somehow, this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon, gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's coupons, was forced to kill Leon in the process. And he went out to keep another date and walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down, huh? And somebody still has those bills, and I'm in for a divorce suit, huh? Hmm. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it, could be. Cops caught him. And the police have the briefcase? Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crimes, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. I have a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me, Marlowe. Then that's what it'll cost you. Good luck and thank you, Mr... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? Marlowe. My name is Frank Barsley. Barsley? Oh. And just what does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer. Yeah. Yes, how'd you know? Never mind. May I use your telephone? Someday I must tell you about Ibarra. Now he's a soul of the earth, Ibarra. Detective lieutenant over at Central Homicide. Well, I phoned Ibarra from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well-dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibarra time to check my tip and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Yeah, I thought Waldo might have had them up there. Whose pearls were they? The ladies. Go on. Oh, they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Yeah. What? Yeah. They might have. Yeah. Also a batch of bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Bosley. Yeah. The police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They want to prevent or solve crimes, right? So? So I've got $500 for the police fund. Mm. If those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. Quit your kidding. It's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. Take it away. On the level, Ibarra? Just tell me straight what it's all about. All I ask. Sure, sure. Well, you see, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills. Mm-hmm. Bosley, that's the guy's name, sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Waldo killed him and then stepped out and got nailed by that guy in the bar he'd stool pigeoned against once. Mm-hmm. Well, if Bosley's name stays out of the papers, I get 500 bucks. It goes to the police fund. Thanks. We'll keep them out. I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. Sure. And like you say, Marlowe, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Look, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, you better take them to her, Marlowe. You see, except for that diamond propeller clasp on them, they're phony. Phony? But look, Marlowe, I know pearls. Real pearls feel gritty between the teeth. These are hard and glassy. Try. 
Yeah. Yeah. They're phony. All but the clasp, Marlowe. All but the clasp. I took the pearls and had them appraised the next morning at a gilt-edged place in Beverly Hills. Phony all but the clasp. An imitation as good as these couldn't have been made that fast. These were the pearls that Waldo had stolen. I took the glass pearls to a dive on Melrose and had them duplicated for $28. I had the jeweler attach the diamond clasp to the $20 duplicate string of pearls. Then I called up Lola. Hello, Lola. Okay, you're in? Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Yes, it's okay here. I have a string of pearls for you. Oh, really, Philip? Really, did you get... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Lola. Waldo was getting set to jip you. We sold the real pearls and made up a string with the diamond clasp. Oh. Well, may I at least have the clasp? Sure. Meet me at four at Nikolaev's. Nikolaev's at four. I'll be there. These are the pearls the police found in Waldo's car. You were right. They're not my pearls. I'm sorry, Lola. No. I still have the clasp that Johnny gave me. Well, I'm happy if you are. Happy? No, not quite happy. See, this morning my husband told me we're to separate. No, oh, I'm very sorry, Lola. You've been very kind. That's all right. This is... Goodbye, I suppose. Yeah. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas. Goodbye, Lola. And if anybody ever bothers you again, let me know, huh? Name's Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. I'll remember. Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu, and then I parked, and then I walked way out on a rock cliff jutting into the Pacific Ocean. And then I reached into my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. <laughs> I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. Should have seen the gulls swoop down on them. Then they flapped up again, screaming indignantly. Phony pearls. They'd fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley. But they couldn't fool a seagull. I said aloud, To the memory of Johnny Delmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once I realized that the wind had died. The Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. It was cool again. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, Red Wind, Lola was played by Peggy Weber and Barry Kroger was Baldy. Joan Banks played Eugenie Kolchenko. Jeff Corey was Lieutenant Ibarra. Carly Bear was Barsley. Lou Krugman was Waldo, and Wilms Herbert played the bartender. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars.
Philip Marlowe will be back in just a moment. Young man, be a Marine. Combine travel, adventure, and education at no expense to yourself. When you're a Marine, you can travel to the far places of the earth and carry on at the same time your own educational program through free Marine Corps Institute correspondence courses. You have plenty of courses to choose from, and an ideal way of studying geography or history is to take a course dealing with the background of the area in which you are stationed or any of the more than 160 Marine Corps Institute courses. Thanks to this Marine Corps Institute, thousands of Marines are making continual educational advancements during their service in the U.S. Marine Corps. That opportunity upon becoming a U.S. Marine is yours for the asking. Check with your nearest Marine Corps recruiting office tomorrow for complete information. Next week at this same time, be sure to tune in for another adventure of Philip Marlowe when Marlowe says, I was low, very low the night I set out searching for the girl with the strange hazel eyes. The fog which hung over Los Angeles didn't help. And I felt even worse when I found her. For by then I had death on my hands. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsi Program. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Huffman. Capsident presents Philip Marlowe, Hollywood's famous private detective created by Raymond Chandler. Philip Marlowe, tough, cynical, private eye of Murder, My Sweet, the sardonic, case-hardened detective of the Brasher Doubloon, the Lady in the Lake, and the Big Sleep. You've seen him in action in all of those top-flight mystery pictures. Now, in order that you may continue to enjoy this exciting mystery series, Tutsin brings you The Adventures of Philip Marlowe on the air with a cast of noted radio players and starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Angeles that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair, make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends up in a fight, and neat little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards in the ground glass of my office door. So I opened the door and closed it from the outside and locked it and got to get up there before I went up to my apartment. Uh, fill her up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlowe. Marlowe. Marlin is a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey. Hey, you bartender. Come in on a ride. That drunk again. What'd you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Make it snappy, yeah. Be right with you, sport. I gotta draw this man a beer. Crowd loud, these stumble bums that come in here. You got another customer, Bacchus? Hey, bud. You seen a lady in here lately? A lady? Tall, good looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Nobody like that's been in. Ah, it's straight scotch, fast. I left my engine running out there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This slick-looking, sarcastic guy stepped up to the bar and drank his scotch whole. Then he turned to go out and stopped. The drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke curl. Very little. All right, show other guys. Don't move. So long, Waldo. I don't know you two. Oh, Waldo. But I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. I right, get on that phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. 
Holy smoke. Not too late. He's over the way of this dead guy's car. Uh, maybe he ain't dead. Uh, he's dead, all right. Where's your phone? This is for the police. The prowl car boys were there in about five minutes. Waldo was out of business, all right. And nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's tall, brown-haired, pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about nine o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a tall, brown-haired, pretty girl in the bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. I said, excuse me, I'm in a hurry. I'll keep you good enough. Look, you better not go outside in those clothes. Just what do you mean by telling me this? This isn't a make. You're in trouble. Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you in those clothes. But I haven't done anything that's... I'm in room 41 across the hall now. I never collected matching in my life. All right, I'll go with you. I'll go. I got to my room and rustled up some scotch and soda and brought the girl her glass. She had a small automatic in her hand. It jumped up at me, and her eyes were full of panic. I put down both glasses on the table slowly so that I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, maybe this wind has got you crazy, too. Don't move. Careful, don't move. A man just got shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket, like yours. What do you look like, this man? Tall, 5'11", slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter, dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you earlier tonight to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? He used to be my chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? Why? Listen, he asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell them. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Walter to steal? Fifteen thousand dollars. Oh, that's peanuts. But it wasn't the value. It meant something to me. The man I loved gave it to me, and now he's dead. He was a flyer shot down over Germany. I'll go back and tell my husband that. He probably hired you. He did? Well, how much is he paying me? And, uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. He's a hydroelectric engineer. I'll have you know that my husband oh, is under... Skip it. I'll take him out to lunch sometime and have him tell me himself. And about Waldo. Whatever he had on you is dead stuck now, like Waldo himself. He's dead. Waldo's dead? Yes, sister. He's dead. Dead, dead, dead. Maybe he is dead. Oh. I scream and I'll give you two black eyes. I'm not going to scream. Who about this? There's a dressing room behind that door. Hide there. Now, don't argue with me. Do it. All right. And I went to the door making a loud yawning sound. The backs of my hands were wet. I opened the door. Without a gun. That was a mistake. I certainly knew the gun I was looking into, a 22 target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head and the flat, shiny eyes and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I, I backed into the room, and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? I was asking. Just making conversation. You stood on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan pen. How is he? Dead. <laughs> I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeeper and me talking. I told him my name, where I lived. That's how, pal. I said, why? I skipped the hangman. would ask you to guess why he's there. Oh, you're pretty tough at that, ain't you? But you're swimming off, pal. All right, but you could get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else. Oh, yeah, sure. Is this better? Is this suit you all right? Uh, so it is my neck. Save when, pal? It's your party. I leaned against the gun. The door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her iris. She, she was scared. She had her gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She'd try to make the door screen either way. It'd be curtains for both of us. You scared, mister? You worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy. And her horrified face was drifting toward us. 
My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Go on, say the word. Well, don't take all night about it if you're if you're going to do something about it. Why not, pal? I like this. I suppose I yell. Go ahead, yell. Go ahead. Put up your hand. Hey, look. Oh. Thanks, sister. Thanks. That that buys me. Everything I have is yours now and forever. You flatter me no end, lady. I only punched him. All right now, get out of here while I call the cops down on this killer. Good night. Good hey, night. wait, wait. Leave that Blair jacket here. Mock you for the cops. Oh, yes, here. Okay. See you again? What? Oh, I don't know. No, I guess not. After all, who am I to be the rival of a dead flyer? I'll see if the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. <laughs> Yeah? Me, me? Yes. Please. Oh, you. Again, huh? Get in. I must talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters, huh? Yes. Well, I went down there with the law and gave him the story. I left you out of it. Thank you. You saved my life, so no one knows a thing about you. Well, incidentally, neither do I. Well, my name is Mrs. Frank Bosley. 212 Fremont Place, Olympia 24596. Is that what you want? I guess so. Well, there he is. Now, why did you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Pearls? Yes. Pearls, too, huh? All right. Tell me about the pearls. You've had a murder and a beautiful mystery woman and a sadistic killer and a heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from a man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets and there weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? It's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do in this apartment house. Well, why didn't I know him? At least by sight. He moved in last week. He managed to get a sub lab. Yeah, great. A sort of an amateur magician on the side, huh? It's getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. You could have brought him along. You could have sat in the back seat working out a problem in hydroelectrics while... While what? Well, I didn't have any answers that wouldn't sound cheap or just ridiculous if from the sophomore class and right now to... I had an unlit cigarette in my hand. I threw it out of the window. I took a hold of her and kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. I wasn't always that way. Only since Johnny Dalmas was killed in the war, he gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them perfectly matched with the diamond of the color cloth. I'd have loved him if they'd been wooden deeds because he gave them to me. I love Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand me? Hmm. What's your name? Lola. Lola, how did you explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband? I told him the limitation and I bought for myself. How did Walter latch on to him and what they stood for? Well, my husband was in Argentina, Walter, and I go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together, but that's all. But you confided in Waldo about his pearls. I was a fool. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you, or he'd tell Papa. Huh? I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment? I suppose it's a lot to ask. No, sweetheart. No. I've been paid. I'll go look. We're here. Got along, Lola? No. No? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. Man? Who? You know a man named Leon Bostanos? Not by name. I don't know. Mexican, right? South American, about uh, 45, small, iron gray hair, very neat, fawn colored suit, wine colored tie. No, I don't think I know such a man. Is he the one in Waldo's room? Yeah. What do you have to say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He's dead. I 
sat with Lola Barsley in a car listening to that jittery, infuriating desert wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Walter's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling, and I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun and a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could use it. Someone? Walter? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars have us? Been there for hours. We've had a flat party to wait for you. Leon, the man in Walter's room, came in that car, but according to the key containers he carried... That isn't his car. Whose car is it? Does it matter? Well, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the keys. A lady? Well, anyway, a woman, if you can split hairs. Eugenie Kolchenko, hmm? In West Los Angeles? Never heard of her. Uh-huh. All right, well, you go home now, huh? What are you going to do? <laughs> Drive that flossy convertible around, wave at my friends, impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. <laughs> Yes? What is it, please? Miss uh, Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes? What is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Now, don't be alarmed. I found it and I brought it home to you. Come in, please. This is a reward you wish. Shall we say... Snap that... out of a dragon lady. Who was he? Who was who? A little guy, Leon. You loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? Oh, oh no, no. Oh, yes, yes. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, honey? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? The gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. She's dead. Darling, she's dead. Well, that's putting it more bluntly, of course. There, do. Hmm? Completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Mm-hmm. You told the police yet? Never do at once what can be deferred pending negotiations. He's something. I'm not negotiated. No. Oh, peachy. What do you know, Marlowe? A man named Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happened to have the inside as to who he was, and when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leo Balsanos. Dead. He wouldn't have had $500 in 20s on him, would he? No, but this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed at that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Oh. Well, is there a basis there for negotiation yet? Very well, Marlowe. I'm a married man. There were certain unpaid bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But you told me I might charge to your account. All right, so I wasn't very bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the unpaid bills safely in my briefcase. Somehow this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon and gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's dough and was forced to kill Leon in the process. Then he went out to keep another date and accidentally walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down. And someone still has those bills. And I didn't throw them off. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it. Yeah, that could be. The cops caught him. Oh. And the police have the briefcase. Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crime, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. Look, I've got to find it to a headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth five hundred dollars to me. Well, then that's what it'll cost you. Well, good luck. And um Thank you, Mr. Uh, Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember. My name is Frank Barsley. Bars. Barsley. Oh. What does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer? Yeah. How did you know? My voices tell me. Who? Oh. Darling, this man is manifestly insane. It's the heat, Miss Kolchenk. It's the Santa and it's the desert wind. May I use your telephone? <laughs> Someday I must tell you about Ibarra. Salt of the earth, Ibarra, detective lieutenant over Central Homicide. I phoned Ibarra from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well-dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibarra time to check my tip and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room, only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Well, I thought Waldo might have them up there. Hmm. Whose pearls were they? A lady's. Go on. Or they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Mm, yeah. Well, what, yeah? They might have. Also a batch of unpaid bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Barsley? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, now, the police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They they want to prevent or to solve crime, right? 
So? So I've got $500 for the police fund if those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. <laughs> Great to give. No, no, it's a, it's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. That's it. Forty-one pearls, perfectly matched diamond propeller clasp. That's it. That's the one. Take it away, Morrow. On the level? Mm -hmm. Just tell me straight what it's all about, all oh, I ask. Sure, sure. Well, this Walla was blackmailing a wife with the pearls, and her husband with the bills, by the name of Barsley. Well, Barsley sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo killed Leon, then stepped out and happened to get shot by that guy at the bar. Now, if Barsley's name stays out of the paper, I get $500, and that goes to the police fund. We'll keep him out. Well, now, I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. And as you say, Mo, the police sound in business to sling mud. Well, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, she no, 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 Mo. Uh, you better take them to her. You see, except for the diamond propeller clasp on them, they're, uh, they're phony. Ph phony? But if... All but the clasp, Mo. All but the clasp. <laughs> So the flyer, Johnny Downs, the great lover, had given Lola a string of fake pearls. Well, I didn't know how to tell her, but I called her up and told her to meet me at the beachcombers at two. I was going to slip her the bad news slowly. I'm glad you asked me to meet you here, Mr. Marlowe. See, I... I had to have someone to talk to. Go ahead. Go ahead, talk. I'm listening. No, Mr. Marlowe. Now more than ever, I must... I must have those pearls. Why? Money trouble? Oh, no, no. It's just that everything's gone wrong. And this morning, my husband told me where to separate. Oh, I'm sorry, Lola. But if I had Johnny's pearls, it would be a link with the past. And with Johnny, it only meant to me. It's how a woman feels, Mr. Marlowe. I wouldn't blame you for not understanding. Maybe I do, though. So please, Mr. Marlowe, please. We'll try to find my pearls. Lola, look, I... Even if it isn't all of them. Any part of them, any... Any single smallest one. It'll be Johnny's. Look, will you uh, meet me here again around 4 o'clock? I'll be here. Okay, I'll see what I can do. There was only one earthly decent thing I could do. I took Lola's glass pearls to a jeweler and I had him take off the diamond glass and put it on one of those strings of so-called simulated pearls that they send you for three bucks, tax included. Then I went back to keep my four o'clock date with Lola at the beachcombers. Well, Mr. Marlowe, anything new? Yes, the uh, police found some pearls in Waldo's car. They found my pearls? No, no, not, not exactly. Not exactly. Well, Waldo was getting set to jip you, Lola. He had the diamond clasp of your necklace attached to a string of cheap imitations. And then he sold the real pearls. Oh, how... Oh. These are the imitations, yeah. Yes. But it is my clasp. The clasp is real. Is that all right? Yes, it's the clasp that Jenny Dalmas gave me. Of course, of course it's all right. Oh, that's well. Thank you so much, Mr. Marlowe. Forget it. I won't. Not if... Well, just goodbye. Yeah, I think so. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas, will you? If anybody ever bothers you again, though, well, let me know. Name's Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu and then I parked and walked out on that rock cliff. Then I reached in my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra found in Waldo's car. I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. The gull swooped down on them and they flapped up again, screaming indignantly. The phony pearls had fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley, but they couldn't fool a seat, though. I said to myself, to the memory of Johnny Dalmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once I realized that the wind had died. The Santa had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the first of a new mystery series, Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. 
Tonight's story on the adventure of Philip Marlowe is based on Red Wind, written by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. It was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger. Third with Van Heflin was Doreen Tuttle as Lola Barsley. And this is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at this same time to another exciting story on The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. I felt low, very low, the night I set out searching for the girl with the strange hazel eyes. The fog which hung over Los Angeles didn't help, and I felt even worse when I found her. For by then I had death on my hands. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Barlow, we bring you tonight's gripping story, The Persian Slippers. One of those thin, chilly fogs had sneaked in from the Pacific and it hung vaguely to the streetlights along the Sunset Strip. It was a kind of a fog that you could see through, but everything was out of focus. It made you start wondering what you were going to do when you were 90 and you were all alone. I'd have liked to have spent the night in a room full of noisy extroverts playing charades. But instead, I had to eat a quick dinner and drive up into the secluded Hollywood Hills to meet a guy. A guy who had nothing but trouble on his mind. When I pushed the buzzer, I had the feeling of wishing I was someplace else. Carl Delaney himself opened the door. He was grim and brusque and to the point. Marlowe? That's right. Come in, Marlowe. I appreciate this. You're coming up here after business hours, I mean. I wouldn't have asked, except, uh, well, perhaps I waited too long as it is. Sit down. Thanks. Waited too long for what, Mr. Delaney? Thirty-six hours ago, my wife disappeared. Marla, you've got to find her for me. Find her just as fast as you can. Wait a minute. Disappeared, you said. Would you mind playing that part back a little slower? Norma simply walked out that door, got in her car, and drove off to get hold of herself, as she always does when we've quarreled. And always before, she's come back in an hour or so. This time... This time she simply didn't come back, is that it? Look, Mr. Delaney, I could... You'd uh... better let me finish before you do anything. Lately, my wife has been brooding over something, something serious that she refused to discuss. I've caught her crying several times, and she's not a woman given to tears. Marlowe, I'm sure that unless we move fast, when we do find her, we're going to find her dead. Suicide? Yeah. With his thick, blunt hand, Delaney reached for a color portrait lying face down on the table and gave it to me. I looked and saw the face of a dream. A beautiful dream with strange hazel eyes and soft black hair. I felt Delaney watching me as I glanced up in time to catch the fading end of a very ugly expression on his face. I handed the picture back to him and he laid it on the table again, face down. Then he took me upstairs to Norma's room. It was a nice, frilly room, typically haunted by elusive sweet smells. There was only one incongruous note. What was the horoscope doing on her desk? From the looks of a picture, I knew that Norma was attractive enough that she didn't need to look to the stars for a future. A horoscope? Yeah, you know how women are. Marla, will you find her for me? Well, I'll try. My rate is $25 a day plus expenses. And remember, you hired me to find her, not bring her back. Fair enough. You just find her. I'll be satisfied. Hmm. I'll need a starting point. Were there any phone calls or letters or anything that might be a lead? What about friends? We have no close friends. Norma always stayed to herself. Wait, uh, there was a phone call yesterday from, uh, Madame Jeanette, I think it was. Who's that, a dressmaker? I haven't any idea. She wanted to speak to Mrs. Delaney. I told her Norma was out, and she asked that my wife call her when she got back. That's all there was to it. Anything else you can tell me? No. Uh, No, it's not much to go on. I don't see what I can do, Mr. Delaney. I'll be here all night, Marlowe. Call me if you need anything. I'll do that. Good night. I drove back through the persistent fog to Sunset Boulevard. It was 9.30. I knew it was going to be like tracking a hummingbird through the petrified forest by the bent twigs, but I got a classified directory and I started digging. 
I checked the hairdressers, the manicurists, and the milliners, and I was just about to start on the interior decorators when I remembered the horoscope on Norma's desk. I quickly turned to the personal consultants. Yeah, there it was. Madame Jeanette. Her establishment, located in the dubious neighborhood south of Olvera Street, turned out to be a tacky cottage set back next to an alley. It was as dark inside as out. I was pounding on the door like a vampire at sunrise when a newsboy came up the path. Looking for Madame Jeanette? Yeah, yeah, you know her? Sure, she tells fortunes. Says I've got a great career line. You want to see it? Not right now, thanks. And I'll say for her that she's a sound sleeper. Maybe, but not so early as this. About this time, she's always hanging around that bar on the corner. Tonight, she's throwing a farewell party in there. Farewell party? Who for? Herself. She's leaving town. Oh, thanks a lot. Here, kid. Gee, a buck. My old man will swear I've been shooting crap again. Give me another one, Charlie. About every night, I say goodbye to my dear old neighborhood. Must get tell again, Jeanette? Yeah. Did I say dear old neighborhood, Charlie? I think you did, Jeanette. Must have had one too many then. Because of all the low, flea bitten row of shacks I ever lived in, this is the new low. Ah, oh, Jeanette, that's no way to talk. You hurt my feelings. Pinky. There ain't nothing like a little beer to soothe her feelings. <laughs> yeah, you said it. Jeanette, can I have another? Yeah. Charlie, give Pinky another. Now, this is his last. The last? I thought you said it was a farewell party. Hey, you with all your dough. This does to get me out of this rat trap of a town, see? It's the last I want to see out of it in all my life, see? Yeah, 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 Another must see. Tell, Charlie. Yeah. Hold on a Jeanette. Hey, what'll it be, mister? Something just a bit drier than Muscatel. Say, Scotch? It's on me, mister. It's my party. Well, well, this is indeed a pleasure. You're the Madame Jeanette, aren't you? Yeah, Why? You're all of 20 years younger than what I expected. Probably the life I lead. Hey, wait a minute. Why should you be expecting anything about me? I don't know you. Perhaps not, but I know you. From where? Oh, you're more famous than you think. Your reputation has spread far beyond Olvera Street. In fact, it's gone up as far as the Sunset Strip, Madame Jeanette. No kidding. How would you kid a fortune teller? Don't you know all, see all, and tell all? Well... And judging from that Spanish shawl, your Hungarian skirt, and those embroidered Persian slippers, I'm beginning to think your fame is not only local, but international. Say, you're beginning to make me feel like I shouldn't be giving up this racket after all. Giving up fortune-telling? No. Yeah. I'm leaving town on a midnight train. Gonna spread my talents all over the East, and I'm not coming back. Don't tell me your crystal ball has laid a golden egg. So to speak, yeah. I come into some lettuce. Suddenly. That's always nice. Well, I guess it means you won't be interested in the few paltry dollars I'd intended to spend with you. Hey, can I have another beer, Jim? Shut up, Pinky Blow! Ah, oh, just a... Traveling lady can always use a little extra moolah. What was it you wanted, bud? I'm looking for someone. Norma Delaney. Norma De... I'm afraid I don't know anybody by that name. I'm afraid you do. What's your angle? Who are you, anyway? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Some private dick you must be to have to resort to fortune tellers. Come on, Jeanette, look into your crystal muscatel, see if you can spot Norma Delaney. I told you once. I don't know the name. Now, blow. Just a minute, Dark Eyes. Hey, Charlie. Yeah? This bird's crabbing my party. What kind of a joint is this, anyway? Lady can't sit here and have a farewell party without being insulted by every jerk that drops in. Well, mister. I haven't finished my drink yet. You got pockets, ain't you? Just pour a drink into one of them and take it along. You ain't finishing it here. Charlie reached under the bar for his pick handle, so I left without pursuing the subject further. But I knew Jeanette was lying right in her purple lipstick about Norma. I walked back to my car, lit a cigarette, and spent a few precious minutes trying to decide whether or not to break into her place and snoop. Then I caught the shadow of a figure slipping up on me from behind. I turned... Wait, wait, don't swing, Mike, don't swing. It's only me, Pinky. I, I... I was in the bar when you was talking to the madam. That tightwad, Jeanette. Yeah, I saw you, so? She did something the minute you left. <laughs> I figured you might like to know what it was. It all depends. Well, I, I thought it might be worth something to you, like a saw, maybe. Come I, on, you no, spill it. Wait a minute. 
Wait, wait, wait. wait. If it's any good at all, it's worth a five and no more. Oh, all right, all right. She, she made a phone call. Who to? What'd she say? Nothing. Just some swear words in Spanish. The line was busy. <laughs> well, I, I kept my eyes open and I got the number. All right, let's have it. If you can still remember it. Oh, I can remember it. Easy. Uh, five of first, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the number was Crenshaw, 1929. <laughs> but you get it? <laughs> like the year of the big crash. <laughs> Thanks to the thirst of an underweight lush, I wasn't at the end of my rope yet. I drove as far as the nearest drugstore, dropped a nickel in a slot and dialed. Crenshaw, the year of the big crash. Hello? Hello, let me speak to Norman Delaney, please. I'm afraid you must have the wrong number. Look, you, I'm trying to locate Mrs. Delaney. I suggest you help me. How did you get this number? From a client, Mr. Carl Delaney. But that's impossible. Let's stop sparring. We can save each other a lot of wear and tear if we get together and talk this over. Maybe you're right. Yes, that sounds sensible. I'm at the Beachwood Apartments, number four. Check. I'll be right out. Mr. Uh, Pierre Gillum, it says here on the door. Yes. Are you the man who called? Uh-huh. Philip Marlowe. Come in, won't you? You said you were looking for Norma Delaney, Mr. Marlowe. Tell me what's wrong. Has anything happened to her? Well, her husband seems to think she might have killed herself, but I have a hunch that you might have something interesting to oh, say. No, poor kid. Poor Norma. Well, I'll tell you what I can, Marlowe, but it isn't much. Oh, I'm all ears, and I'll sit. Thanks. I was in love with Norma once, briefly, a long time ago. She was a wonderful girl, but her husband was insanely jealous. Mm -hmm. Even though she hadn't loved him for years, he refused to give her up. He even threatened to kill her first. Oh? Norma and I realized that serious trouble lay ahead, so we parted. Good friends. And I haven't seen her or heard from her in months. I buy it all but the last line. You have seen or heard from her, and recently... I'm not going to argue that. I've told you the truth. You can take it or leave it. I leave it. I suppose we both put our cards on the table. You lied to me when you said Carl Delaney gave you my number. I know because Madame Jeanette called me shortly after you did. Touche. But uh, why did she run to call you at the mention of Norma's name if you two broke up months ago? And incidentally, how did that ersatz oracle Jeanette get mixed up in this in the first place? That is a long story, Marlowe. Good, I like long stories. I'll bet it begins just for a lock. Norma and I went down to Olvera Street once to have our palms read. Yes, that's exactly how it started. <laughs> Madame Jeanette was an unusual woman, a, a character, you might say. Uh -huh. Well, we became friendly with her. Norma got quite sentimental about her. One day we made a sort of uh, pact. If ever either of us was in trouble and needed the other, we'd go to Madame Jeanette or get a message to her. She would notify the other. So when I walked in asking for Norma, the madam assumed she was in trouble. Right, right. Called me immediately because she herself is leaving town in less than an hour. I know. Well, Mr. Gillum, it's all very interesting, but it's getting me no place. Thanks. If I need you oh, again... Oh, no, uh, wait, Marlowe, don't go. Hmm? Uh, I know a lot of details about Norma that, uh, that I'm sure will be helpful. Uh, for instance, she, she drives a Nash Coupe, a powder blue. Powder blue coupe, huh? Thanks, that'll help. Oh, and, and uh, she has a fondness for white gloves. Wears them quite often. I see. Well, i better get moving. No, no, uh, wait just a minute, Marlowe. I've got to go. Now, listen, Marlowe. I told you I was in a hurry. Now, take it easy. Stick around a while. Get away from that door. Look, just who do you think you are? Come busting in here, prying, asking questions, you dirty... Ooh! You asked for it, Gillum? I do You got a left, too, huh? So have I, brother. <laughs> Left Gillum sprawled all over his coffee table, as limp as a five-cent salad. Outside, I glanced at my watch. Madame Jeanette's train left in 40 minutes. I ran through 22 bucks worth of red lights getting down to a cottage because I was sure Gillum's attempted stall was tied in with a departure. But I couldn't figure out why. That is, I couldn't until I switched out my lights and coasted to a stop in front of her place. Then I saw it. Half hidden in the shadows back of the house... Sat a powder blue coupe. 
got up on the porch close to the front door and listened. Jeanette was talking to a woman. I couldn't catch what they were saying, but one thing was certain. The woman was Norma Delaney. All at once I realized the talk had stopped. That was my cue. I shoved open the door and went in. Jeanette sat at a table alone, facing me. Well, Mr. Marlowe, you've returned. What is it this time? I'd like my fortune told. Yeah? Now, listen close, Gumshoe. I'll make this a short and snappy reading because I'm catching a train in 15 minutes. There's a woman very close to you. In fact, she's right behind you, sucker! What? No! finally opened my eyes again, nothing changed. It took me a long time to figure out that the lights were off and it was dark. I climbed up the table leg hand over hand and switched on a lamp. Jeanette's house was absolutely quiet. I had caught a glimpse of a white glove holding known as a blunt instrument just before I dozed off. And that reminded me what I was down here for. I wobbled through the kitchen and out the back door, but the pot of blue coupe was gone. It was 12.15. My head and the fog both had gotten a little thicker. So I just stood there, useful like a ping-pong ball in a bowling alley. It was the sound of footsteps that finally moved me, and the newsboy was back. Well, hi again, mister. Did you ever get a hold of Madame Jeanette before she left? Yeah, yeah, but not tight enough. Say, a blue coupe left here a few minutes ago. Did you see it? Nope, I didn't. Gee, I'm sure sorry she went away. She gave me a buck tonight, too. Said she was coming into a fortune. Hey, you and your career like... Say, what's that down there? In those weeds? I don't know. It looks like some kind of a shoe. Yeah. Yeah, it is a shoe. Here, see? What do you know? A Persian slipper. I took the slipper along as a souvenir for my scrapbook and walked back to my car. Trying to fit Norma Delaney's lovely hazel eyes in with that crack on the skull. But I couldn't. Between throbs of my headache, I figured Pierre Gillum would know why Norma had dropped in on the madam so close to train time. I decided to go back and ask him. <laughs> Gillum was as reliable as a two-headed quarter and just as tricky. So when I got to his apartment, I pushed the buzzer, stepped back, and braced myself. But there was no fight left in him. He opened the door in his robe, fingered the mouse I had given him, and grinned. Oh, so you found your way out by yourself. Uh-huh. Say, Gillum, what was so important about Norma seeing Madame Jeanette just before a train left? I don't know. Uh, you knew enough to try to keep me here to delay me? Why? Oh, Marlowe, I did that for old time's sake, for an old friend. Jeanette asked me to hold you here until midnight, and I tried my best. <laughs> Obviously wasn't good enough. Well, that's all I know about it. I see your phone is off the hook. Do you know that? Yeah, I took it off. It's given me nothing but trouble tonight. I hereby wash my hands of this whole business. I'm going to bed. And I hope to sleep. Good night. I envied him and left to call my client, Carl Delaney. He said he'd be in all night, but the phone kept ringing and ringing and no one answered. I suddenly got a very creepy feeling. And 20 minutes later, I pulled to a stop at that small but elegant house. The lights were on, and I saw the powder blue coupe in the garage next to Carl's big black sedan. I ran up the steps. The front door was ajar, so I went in. I found Carl Delaney in front of the fireplace, face down on the floor, dead. There was a handbag on a chair. I opened it, compact cigarettes, and a key to room 340 in the Bradford Arms Hotel. No identification. That color portrait of Norma was standing up on the table this time. And those searching hazel eyes seemed to follow me all the way to the telephone. Lieutenant Ibarra speaking. Phil Marlowe, Ibarra. There's a dead one at 1077 Hollycrest Road. Named Carl Delaney. Murdered. I'll be right out. <laughs> up the phone and then the hair on my neck crawled as I heard the unmistakable sound of a woman's heels on the floor upstairs. 
I ducked behind a door as the heels clicked down the steps. And then she entered the room. Norma Delaney was lovely. As lovely as a picture. She moved calmly and deliberately. Put a note on the table, picked up the handbag. And then turned to face the door I was hiding behind. You can come out now, Mr. Marlowe. Hello, Mrs. Delaney. You can call me Norma now. And if you're thinking of using your gun, perhaps you'll be good enough to read this note first. Here. To whom it may concern, I, Norma Delaney, purposely and with premeditation, shot and killed my husband, Carl. It is beyond me to express how deeply I hated him, and since I must pay for this and cannot endure a public spectacle, I shall take my own life within the next few minutes. Now look, Norma, no guns. Easy, Marlowe. I'll kill you if necessary. But it would be so pointless now. I'm free at last, and I want to spend a little time left to me in my own way. Norma, if you'll listen to me, Stay just back. a minute. Tonight I made my only friend, Madame Jeanette, happy. And I killed a man who needed killing. Something good, something bad. So I'm quitting, even up. What do you propose to do with me? You mustn't try to stop me, Marlowe. See that closet? Mm-hmm. Get inside. And careful how you move your hands. Turn around to the wall. That's it. Marlo, I'm sorry I had to hit you with Jeanette tonight. Goodbye. It took three shots to smash the lock on that closet door. I heard her driving away just as I got it open. In spite of what she'd said, I couldn't let her kill herself. I ran outside to my car. One glance under the hood was all it took. There was nothing left of the wiring but loose ends. I ran into the street and a miracle happened. The first time in my life, a taxi in Los Angeles when I wanted it. I'm sorry, fella. I'm going to call. Skip it. This is an emergency. Hey, wait a minute. You Police can't... business. A girl is driving up the road in a blue coupe. we got to catch her before she kills herself. Let's go. I saw a taillights just then. Yeah? Can't you go any faster? Not on these curves, brother. I got a wife and kids. Okay, fella. We'll be at the top of the hill when we can get around the next bend. We should spot her then. Yeah. You can see the whole road down the other side. Here we are, mister. This is the top. But I don't see her. Where is she? Hey, wait a minute. Stop here. Turn up your motor. This is haywire. I don't get it. We were gaining on her, and now she just disappears. Hey, what's that? The motor. That side road we passed. That's it. Hey, look. Look! Holy smoke. We both saw the awful sight for just an instant. A powder blue coupe with a woman crouched over the wheel. It shot out of that side road, crashed through the guardrail, and fell end over end down into the gorge. By the time we got to the hole in the fence, the wreck was an inferno. Oh, no use trying to get down there. The whole hillside will be on fire in another minute. I guess she pulled over here into the side road and waited for us to go by. And we did. Yeah. Sandy here, too. So wonder if she didn't get stuck. What's the matter? There's something buried here in the sand. One of her tires ran over it. What is it? Why, it's... It's plenty, brother. Come on, turn that hack of yours around. Let's get off this mountain. I just found the answer to a lot of questions. <laughs> You, Marlowe? Yeah, Lieutenant. We found the body and the wife's suicide note. Then one of the boys spotted that fire up on the hill. What is it? Car went off the road. An accident? Or the suicide? Just a little of both, Ibarra, but we'll talk later. Right now, we gotta go to the Bradford Arms Hotel on the double. And please, no siren. <laughs> Bradford Arms was a three-story walk-up. When we got there, Ibarra stationed one man in front, sent another to cover the back, and we started up the stairs. We had reached the second floor when we saw him on the landing above. Gillum. He spotted us at the same time and turned back fast. There, Marlow. Who's that? That's our boy, Ibarra. Here, Gillum, let's go. There he goes. He's heading for the fire escape. Second lieutenant, he's all yours. I got business the other way. Hey, hey, you stop her, I 
340. It's all over now. You better drop the gun. Please, it's been neat so far. Don't mess it up. Come on, beautiful. Drop it. That's better. Well, Marlow, I got him. I had to wing him to bring him down, but here he is. And uh, the lady must be... Uh... Yes, Lieutenant. The lady is Norma Delaney. The girl who wanted to kill her jealous husband and then commit suicide, but didn't want to die doing it. So she used someone else's body, Madame Jeanette's, which was a logical choice because Jeanette was blackmailing her. Thus two vultures with one stone, leaving two lovebirds free to fly away together. Right, Norma? Didn't you give Madame Jeanette money so she'd leave town and tell everybody she was going away? Yes, I did. That way the body wouldn't be missed, huh? Yeah. Isn't it pretty? Oh, lay off, Marlowe, can't you? Okay, Gillum, okay. Ellie Barr, I've got a sour taste in my mouth. I think I'll go home and goggle. Anything else you need? No, I guess not, Phil. I've had all that's necessary. Uh, wait. Just one thing. How do you get inside this setup? How do you find out it was the dead Madame Jeanette who went over the cliff instead of the very much alive Mrs. Delaney here? Well, Jeanette had on a pair of Persian slippers, Lieutenant. One fell off down at her cottage where Norma murdered her and put her in the trunk of the car. The other one fell off in the sand of that side road when she took Jeanette out of the trunk and propped her up behind the wheel. <laughs> it was lucky, Burra. Just dumb luck. I took a walk later. A long walk. All by myself. Through that thin, empty fog in the dark, empty streets. A pair of hazel eyes and a pair of Persian slippers went round and round in my head. And for some reason, I kept thinking, a pair of Persian slippers has two soles and two heels. And it's hard to tell just exactly where the one becomes the other. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, The Persian Slippers, Virginia Gregg was heard as Madame Jeanette, with Larry Dobkin as Pierre Gillum and Louis Van Ruten as Carl Delaney. The additional players were Gene Bates as Norma Delaney, Gil Stratton Jr. as the newsboy, Frank Richards as the barkeep, and Tony Barrett as Pinky. Detective Lieutenant Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again next week at this same time when Philip Barlow says... Sounded good, real good. A weekend at Malibu, expenses paid with a cash bonus thrown in. But that was before I knew about the henchman, the redhead, and the corpse. These three and a white Panama hat ruined it all for me. For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring... Van Heflin. <laughs> Philip Marlowe, the famous private detective of Murder My Sweet and The Lady in the Lake, created by Raymond Chandler, brought to you on the air by Pepsodent, and starring MGM's dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. <laughs> Now, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with Irium. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. It's preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three to one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other brand they tried. These families, three to one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, 
makes teeth brighter. Yes, families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. Now, Van Heflin in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. <laughs> Hollywood after midnight is like any other city after midnight. Night moves in and the city becomes hushed and stealthy. The nightclubs close up one by one, but now and then the police whistle and the prowl car siren serenade the sleeper. If you've got any cop in you at all, you get on edge and you have to get dressed and go out and walk it off to relax. Well, I was relaxing past the Swank Carlton Hotel in the Sunset Strip about 1 a.m. when all of a sudden, recess was over. Hey, Marlowe. Hmm? Is that you, Marlowe? It was George Millar, the quiet-spoken night clerk of the Carlton, hailing me from the doorway, probably to Mucha Melacrino. No, I was wrong. Hey, look, Marlowe. Uh, you're very busy right now. Why, Millar, if I may be as cagey as all that? We've got some well, some trouble on the eighth floor. Where's Curly, your fearless house dick? Tonight he has to have a hangover. What's the beef on floor eight? King Leopardi. Do you know him? King Leopardi? Oh, that's the sweetest trump of this side of Gabriel. Is he tenting here tonight? He's in the corridor on the eighth floor, dressed in yellow pajamas and his trumpet. <laughs> There's a girl with him, and they put him on a jam session. Well, suppose the king rejects my diplomatic notes. Well, uh... Get rough, but only if you have to. Okay, thanks. But a guy with such an ear for music ought to listen to reason. All right, I'll be down five minutes more. All right, King, the party's over. Hey! Were you addressing me, peasant? I said, wrap it up, can it? Put it on ice. The show is over. Ha! Conk him, King. King Kong, that's what he is, King Kong. Let him have it, King. Stand fair to a nosy house dick, as follows. <laughs> All right, now look, yellow pants. Wrap up your bugle and buzz off. Now hit the grit. Oh, you're tougher than a 40 cent steak, aren't you? Well, this will make you soft and tender. Here. Get him, boy, King. Get him again for me. All right, hit me with that trumpet, will you? Okay, King. Ooh. <gasps> right, now, come on. Get up, get dressed, and get out. How can he? He's out cold. I'll be glad to pack for him. And you get back to your room, too. Listen, copper, I don't have to do get anything. Get going, sister. Come on, jump. <laughs> The door to room 815 was ajar. I went in and began tossing a lot of that yellow silk that the king liked so well into his suitcases. Something at the small desk stopped me. Tucked under the corner of the desk blotter was a note. It was assembled from words and letters cut out of newspapers and pasted on a telegraph blank. It said, Ten grand by Thursday night, Leopardi, or else. Her brother... I slipped the note in my pocket and went out in the corridor just as the king staggered past me into his room. I could get an infection from the dirty look he gave me as he slammed the door after him. <laughs> the door two suites away opened a crack and then shut again very quickly. I went over and knocked. Beat it, copper! I want to talk to you! I don't want to hear from you! Okay, here I come, sister, ready or not! I'll blow you down, so help me, I'll let you have it. Lay that pistol down, babe. Come on, Get out come on. you pick up weight you didn't count on. And what would the little girl be doing with a twenty-five automatic, I wonder? A girl needs protection with insects like <laughs> you around. Look, what's your name? Little Bo Peep. Okay, but what does little boy blue with a horn mean to you? I admire his work. Do you know King Leopardi? No. Well, what are you doing in a place like this? I can tell you you can't afford it. What's your angle? I won a soap contest. All right, baby, you want it that way? What are you going to do? I'm going to make a phone call. It won't cost you a nickel. Hello, desk? Millar? Miss Marlowe? 
I'm calling for the lady in room 811. She's checking out. I had a little trouble up there, Millar. Your two noisy guests will be checking out any minute. Okay? Oh, well, I hate for things to happen on my shift. Well, the king bopped me with his bugle and the girl had a gun. Gee, nice people. Yeah, how come you put a floozy like that girl so close to the king? Well, I didn't. Another Quirin, thing. the day man did. Look, there was a receipt for rent to Miss Marilyn Delorme on the telephone table in her room. Well, that wasn't the name she gave Quillen. Apartment 211, Ridgeland Apartments, Cord Street, L.A. She lives right in town in a cheap neighborhood, but she checks in here at a price she can't afford and gives a phony name. Now, Why? Why? <laughs> Cord Street, where Marilyn Delorme lived, was old town. Arty town, crook town. It was afternoon when I got off the cogwheel car that climbs the steep hill to where the Ridgeland apartment sat on the top of Bunker Hill. I went up dim, dusty stairs to apartment 211, and I tapped on the door. There was no answer, so I tried the door. It was unlocked. The room inside was dim with stagnant gloom. Marilyn Delorme was in. I didn't talk to her, though. I didn't think she'd want to make much conversation with those blue bruises about her throat, where she'd been strangled. I got out of there fast, wiping off doorknobs like Uriah Heap polishing apples for his boss. I found King Leopardi at his job at the Club Belvedere. He was relaxing at a table in the bar with a kind of a girl commonly referred to as a knockout. She looked tall and her hair was the color of a brush fire seen through clouds of dust. I pulled in my chin and then walked over to the table. Hello, Leopardi, old maestro. You remember me? I'm sorry, I can't say that. Why, you... Dirty keyhole snoopers. King, please don't start anything again. You left a certain little note in your hotel room last night. Get out, night. time a dozen. That wasn't all. That dame with you I last said night. Beat it. King, sit down. Beat it and take this with you. <clears throat> There's not much snap in that punch, King. Would you like to try it again? I, uh, have had some drinks. I'll see you later when I'm okay. See you later, too, Dolores, after the floor show. I'm, uh... I'm sorry, Miss... Uh, Sit Lucy. down. You've made us conspicuous enough as it hey, is. Now, wait a minute. Sit Look, down. Get... Huh. All right, thanks. Well, that's what I get for being a little gentleman and letting him pepper me without a comeback. Oh, he's always spoiling for a fight. Uh, the king just can't control his dukes, can he? You better have a drink. All right. Coke with bitters. <laughs> that's what I love about Hollywood. You meet so many eccentrics. <laughs> yeah, but you see, I'm the kind of a guy who starts with a short beer and wakes up in Shanghai with a full beard. <laughs> <laughs> is this on me or is it on you? Well, that depends. Well, how champagne? Mum's cordon rouge, shall we say, hmm? It's on you. It's on me. <laughs> Coke with bitters. <laughs> how did you get to know King Leopardi? Oh, I just happened to throw him out of his hotel last night. Oh, house detective, huh? No, 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 filling in for a friend. Philip Marlowe, private investigator, is the general tag. Oh. How did you happen to get to know the king? I once sang in his band, but not for long. Well, then, look, tell me, uh, would it be hard for a woman to get to him? Only if he was surrounded by a wall of fire. If the woman had a gun. Why? Well, I found this threat note on his desk last night. It asked for $10,000 or else, and it signed her brother. Well? Well? Yes. A woman with a gun could get to him, and everybody would give her a great big hand. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll skip that Coke and Bitters and say good day and thank you, Christabel. The name is Dolores. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Drury. Kyoza. Dolores Kioza. Oh, Kioza. Fare thee well, Miss Kioza. <laughs> Formal, aren't you? <laughs> so long, Dolores. So long, Philip. If I hear of anything, I'll toss it your way. Mm-hmm. 
The evening papers carried a squib about Marilyn Delorme found strangled in her Cord Street apartment. That was all dead end. Until about one o'clock in the morning when the telephone started having hysterics on my night table. Yeah. Philip, this is Dolores. Dolores. Dolores? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Would sure. you come over to my place right away? 2412 Renfrew Street, below Fountain. Hey, wait a minute. It's a sort I of don't... bungalow court. Mine is the last one in line. Well, sure, but wait a minute. What's the matter? Dolores, look, what's the matter? King Leopardi is here, too. King Leopardi? He passed out in my den. It's absurd, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's absurd. It'll cost you 20 bucks. All right, but hurry. Please hurry. All right, I'll be right over. Phone calls in the dead of night. I should have been a midwife. Oh, come in, Philip. I'm sorry I woke you at this hour. That's okay. I always get up around this time anyhow to take my bitters and answer phone calls. Where is he? Uh, may I... Have a cigarette? Sure. Thanks. Light? Where did you say he was now? In my den. Oh, Philip. Philip, he isn't drunk at all. Did you really think he was drunk? He's dead. What? The king is dead. Long live the... With my... Gun. Mm. Well, good for you. The lady wins the large cupid dog. Hey, come on, let's go and look at him. You are listening to the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. It's preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. Families all over America say new Pepsodent is their favorite three to one. The Paul A. Thompson family, Summer Street, Stanford, Connecticut, preferred new Pepsodent on every single count. The Thompsons say, new Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer new Pepsodent over any other toothpaste they tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Thompsons and other families who compared new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mare, producers of The Hucksters, starring Clark Gable. Delora showed me to the den in the back of the house. Trumpet man King Leopardi was lying on the studio couch, large, smooth, and artificial looking even in death. A small Mauser automatic hung loosely in his right hand. There was a bullet hole in his golden yellow sport coat, right over his heart. Dolores, is this your gun? Uh, yes. Someone gave it to me once. I. I don't even know how to use it. Oh, no. Oh, I on, no. don't expect you or anyone to believe uh, me. Don't expect anything. Just tell it. Well, I, I... I was out late. I sing at KFQC on a late 15-minute program. Agatha and I got home about 11.30. Who's Agatha? The cat? My maid. Mm. I came into the den for some liquor and fizz water and... found him. Like that. 
I sent Agatha the home so she wouldn't find him. Finally, I thought of calling you. Well, he got in here. How? I don't know. Were you ever in love with him? The king never loved anyone. I ask if you loved him. I hated everything about him. It's even better to tell the cops that is, but copacetic. But I can't help it. It's the truth. Dolores, look. <laughs> Go on out in the other room and buy yourself a drink. I want to be alone here with tall, dead, and handsome. Go on now, huh? After Dolores had taken her white face out of that room, I could work better. I went through the king's pocket and found his key ring. One key fit very nicely in the lock of the back door. I went to the living room where Dolores was huddled against the arm of the Davenport trying to become a part of the pattern. Dolores, how long has Agatha been with you? Two years. Hmm. Did you ever steal anything from you? Small things, that's all. A pair of nylons now and then. I, I didn't mind why. Well, she sold a key to somebody. A key to this apartment. Oh, what's the difference, Philip? We're wasting time. I'm done for as a nice person. They'll think it was a lover's quarrel and I shot him. Or that he shot himself over me. Well, you don't die from the latter, though. Your reputation does. And I care about what people think of me. Yeah. Well, that's what makes me for you again, lady. Thanks, Philip. Now, look, suppose you give me a description of Agatha and tell me where she lives. I want to talk to her. Tonight. I drove down Brighton Avenue looking for the house Dolores had described to me. All at once, I slammed on my brakes. In the driveway of a vacant house stood a small coupe. Dolores had described Agatha's car, and that was it. And Agatha did not live in an empty house. Well, I got out and walked up the gravel driveway and looked into the car. And then I got back in my own car and drove until I found an all-night drugstore. I phoned Detective Lieutenant Ibera. Hello, Ibera. Write this down. Brighton Avenue... 3200 block, west side. Driveway of empty house. Car parked with dead woman in it. When alive, answered to the name of Agatha. Strangled. I went back to the Carlton Hotel where it all started the night before. Quillen, the head day clerk, was on night duty. That surprised me a little bit. It was 2 a.m. and very empty, very quiet in the lobby. That was fine. Well, if it isn't Marlowe, the old clues man. A good, good morning. And tripe like that. Hello, Quillen. Look, how come you're on duty? Miller went on vacation this a.m. His brother has a cabin at Crestline on the Arrowhead Road. Well, I didn't even know he had a brother. Now you know. Quillen, look, how come an old hotel man like you registers floozies like that Marilyn Delorme on the same floor with people like King Leopardi? What? You heard me, mine host. I didn't register the girl or Leopardi. Millar did. What? You heard me. Well, why was the room between their rooms empty last night in times like these? Well, Millar had it marked on change. Plumbing out of whack or something. Why? Oh. Well, here's why. A lad with a pass key could have gone into that room and then unlocked the two connecting doors. And then you could have run a bus service between the girls' room and Leah Party's. What are you driving at? That girl in 811 had a gun and Leah Party had a threat letter last night. Now, here's what I want you to do. Call the hotel where Leah Party's staying now and ask if he's there. Why? Because. Good enough? Best reason in the world. Wife always uses it. Wait here. <laughs> About three minutes, Quillen came back and leaned on the counter again. Leopardi isn't there. I talked to a guy in his suite who was almost sober. He said Leopardi got a call about 11 from some girl. What girl? Well, he didn't know. But Leopardi went out preening himself. Mm. Okay, thanks, Quillen. Anything to do with that brawl you had with Leopardi here last night? No, all in the spirit of boyish mayhem. Oh. That, uh, that 815 has a jinx on it, you know. 
Girl shot herself there two years ago. What? A girl shot herself there. Yeah, yeah, you said that, but what girl? I don't know what her real name was. Look here, Quillen. I want to see your hotel files of that day two years ago and all the newspaper clippings about it. Come on. All right, all right. Let go of my arm, physical culture. I'll get the keys to the record room. I read the hotel files of that day two years ago and I read the newspaper clippings of that suicide in 815. Then I asked Quillen just where George Millar's brother had his cabin in the mountains. It was just getting light when I pulled up at the cabin, high against a growth of dagger pine and cedar. Smoke was curling from the chimney. Someone was awake. George Millar himself opened the door. Well, Marlo! Well, gee, it's good to see you. How'd you ever find us up here? How about some bacon and egg? The answer in my brief Marlowe morning manner is yes. Well, that's well. Uh, I'll wake up my brother and we'll all eat together. Huh? You don't have to wake me up. I'm up. Oh, oh, hello, Gary. Who's your friend, George? Oh, Gaff, this is Philip Marlowe. You heard me talk of him. How are you, Marlowe? Gaff Pally. That the name? Yeah, my brother. That's his fighting name. He used to be a heavyweight boxer. Fighter. Boxers dance. Fighters fight. Well, uh, let's get coffee started. Huh? Marlo's hungry. Yeah, say, Arnold, I've had a busy night. King Leopardi's been bumped off. Uh, bumped off? Lowbrow killed. Vernacular for murder. The king is dead. Though. Well, where? Uh, how? Did... In a girl's apartment. Nice girl, too. The old suicide gag. But it could ruin the girl. Oh, gee, that's lousy. Huh? Yeah. No, but it won't work. It was murder. What makes you think it was murder? Well, Gaff, the way I cased the job, the kill was supposed to have been pulled in his room, 815 at the Carlton Hotel, night before last. Uh, is that a fact now? Yeah. I spoil it by giving the king the merry heave ho before the girl in 811 could get to him. Didn't I, George? I guess you did, Marlowe. Yeah. Of course, it would have been poetic justice if King Leopardi had been killed in the same room where a girl committed suicide two years ago. Registered as Mary Smith. Usual name, Eve Talley. Did you hear that, Gaff Talley? Eve Talley. I heard it, Marlowe. So we had a sister named Eve. Shot herself in 815 at the Carlton. So what? So, George here told me that Quillen registered that professional gun girl in 815 night before last. Oh, no. George registered her. So? So George kept the room between the girl and Leopardi vacant. When everything was quiet, he'd open the communicating doors, and Marilyn Delorme would walk into the king's room, muffle her twenty-five in a pillow, and shoot the king in his sleep. How am I doing, boys? Fine, Marlon. How am I doing? Uh, Gaff, put away that gun. I'll bet you even checked on 118 Cord Street. Mm -hmm. I found Marilyn Delorme strangled. She knew too much. For a few bucks, you boys got Agatha to call Leah Party last night from the radio station and pretend she was Dolores with an interesting invitation. The king always had a yen for Dolores, and he came running. You shot the king before Dolores came home and left him in her den. Then Gaff got rid of Agatha. She knew too much, too. Leah Party was the worst kind of a rat, Marlo. We loved our sister. She fell for him, and he threw her out. She killed herself. Now, what would you do, Marlo? It... Take his gun, George. Don't get between us or behind him. His forty-five goes right on through. Uh, I'll have to take your gun, Marlon. Come on. Well, always treat it like your own, won't you, George? Got it, George? I've got it. Stand out of the way. Does it have to be this way, Gaff? Yeah, it has to be this sure, way. Sure, George and Gaff, the avengers of innocent girlhood in their righteous indignation. Shut up, Marlon. Lynch, mobs, tar and feather merchants and other laws unto themselves take notice. George and Gaff, they wrote the book. Say your prayers, big mouth. Hey, Gaff, there's been enough killing. Get out of no, the way. Gaff, I won't. I swear I'll let you have it. No, to. Gaff! I'm warning you. Goodbye, Gaff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to do it. George. He's dead. So I had to do it, Gav. I just had to. You understand, don't you, Marlo? Yeah, yeah, I understand. He was a killer. He killed three people. He wasn't going to kill a fourth. I wanted to finish Leoparo out in the open and take what came, but Gav tried to do it cute. 
I didn't know Leopoldo was dead until you told me, Marlow. I... I believe you, George. Yeah. Here's your gun back, Marlow. It shoots fine. <laughs> I put in a big pitch for George at headquarters. After all, he hadn't killed anybody except Gaff, and that was in self-defense and in defense of an unofficial copper named Marlowe. He won't go get off scot-free, but he won't inhale cyanide either at the taxpayer's expense. After I talked to Ibera at headquarters, I telephoned Dolores Chiosa. I didn't give her the sort of details, but just told her not to worry that she was in the clear. Philip... Oh, thank you, Philip. I'm so relieved. I'm so grateful. I'm so thirsty. Well, come on over then. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this fiesta on you or is it on me? Why? Well, I mean, do I drink Coke and Bitters or Cordon Rouge? It's on me. (laughs) All right, then. Champagne it is, baby. But look, let me bring the glasses, huh? You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the new mystery series, Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Van Heflin will return in just a moment. Men, here's an important announcement. News about a sensational hair tonic discovery. It's trim hair tonic made by Pepsodent. For the first time, science has created a hair tonic with pure virgin olive oil. There's no finer hair and scalp conditioner. Yes, because it contains pure virgin olive oil, Trim Hair Tonic conditions your scalp as it grooms your hair. Get new Trim Hair Tonic during the big one-cent introductory sale at toilet goods counters now. Two 60-cent bottles, $1.20 value, only 61 cents. Ask for Trim Hair Tonic with olive oil. Now, concerning next week's show, here is our star, Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe crouched in the darkness of Beverly Glen and waited for those footsteps to come closer. And then all at once, the sandman hit him without bothering to remove the sand from the sandbag. And when Marlowe woke up in the morning, his wallet and his gun were gone. And he was wanted for murder. Tonight's story was adapted by Milton Geiger from The King in Yellow by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at the same time to another exciting mystery on the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. Sounded good, real good. A weekend at Malibu, expenses paid with a cash bonus thrown in. But that was before I knew about the henchman, the redhead, and the corpse. These three and a white Panama hat ruined it all for me. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, The Panama Hat. I was sitting in my office bombing the ashtray on my desk with paper clips, wondering what kind of a job a private detective gets when clients stop calling completely. I was seesawing between the picture of me as a well-starched huckster and the more comfortable portrait of Marlowe, author in English tweeds, man of distinction. And the telephone brought me to a rude awakening. Marlowe speaking. My name is Isabel Gordon, Mr. Marlowe. I must see you at once. My husband Bruce is in terrible danger. Could you possibly meet me in an hour at the Pelican Inn? It's a small roadside place on the way to Malibu. I'll explain everything then. Pelican Inn. One hour, Mrs. Gordon. <laughs> The Pelican Inn was strictly a liquor license with chairs and a bored piano player in one corner grinding away. The place was empty and I was about to order a drink when the front door opened and a woman entered. 
She was tall and thin and right out of Harper's Bazaar. From double lap ankle strap shoes to close cropped hair. One look at her fear crowded eyes and I knew it was Isabel Gordon. I got up and introduced myself. Then we went to a table and she started to talk. For two weeks now, Mr. Marlowe, my husband Bruce has been receiving unsigned, threatening letters. I'm almost sick with worry. I, I don't know what to do. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Gordon. The first thing to do is to get hold of yourself. And tell me the whole thing right from the beginning. Yes, all right. Well, first of all, Bruce and I have only been married a little more than a year. We're living with my uncle, Avery Fairchild, on an estate out beyond Malibu. I see. What does your husband do for a living, Mrs. Gordon? Why, he's a photographer. Movie or commercial? Well, at present, it's neither. You see, Bruce has been terribly unsettled since the war. Lost, sort of, and Mm -hmm. then recently he got interested in photography, and it's been a great help to him. But he doesn't exactly work at it, huh? Well, he's converted one of the rooms in the guest cottage into a studio, and he spends almost all of his time there experimenting with portrait work. But he doesn't actually have a job, if that's what you mean. How does that appeal to your Uncle Avery? Oh, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Marlowe. My uncle thinks the sun rises and sets on me, but with Bruce... It's total eclipse, is that it? I'm afraid so. All his life, Uncle Avery has been concerned only with dollars and cents. He, he simply doesn't understand or sympathize with an artist's viewpoint. Uh-huh. Now, what about these unsigned letters? Well, Bruce has been getting them for the past two weeks. They're always made up of words cut from newspapers and pasted on ordinary paper. That's a cheap stunt. What do they say? Each one threatens my husband's life. Yet both he and Uncle Avery consider them nothing more than the work of some harmless crank. In spite of the fact that for the last several days I've seen a strange man lurking around our place every night. Can you describe him? No. No, except he's about your height and build. Is that all? Yes. No, I... Wait a minute. There is something else. Each time I saw him, Mr. Marlowe, he was wearing a white Panama. Well, that's not much to go on. Tell me, why haven't you called the police? Uncle Avery wouldn't hear of it. He hates publicity, dreads it. That's why I suggested contacting you, a private detective. Sort of a bodyguard for Bruce, huh? Yes. However, Mr. Marlowe, Bruce is somewhat temperamental, and I know he'd rebel at the thought of being watched over, so I'd... I'd rather you posed as a, a house guest, an old college chum of mine, perhaps. My fee is 25 a day plus expenses, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, any price is all right, Mr. Marlowe. Let's see, it's a little after seven now. Can you be at our place at Malibu at nine? I think so. But as a fellow alumnus, Isabel, one last question. Where'd you go to college? Southern California. Why? Well, I was afraid you might say Vassar. <laughs> After Isabel left, I remembered that I was already on my expense account. So I had a tasteless, cold, hot blue plate special and a burned cup of coffee. Then I stepped out of the Pelican Inn and headed across the paved parking lot to my car. It was already dark, and I was admiring the full moon and the beautiful wash it made over the ocean when it happened. Hey, mister! What the... You all right, mister? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Thanks to your sounding off. That nut was aiming right for you. Yeah, yeah, it looks that way. Did you happen to get his number? No, What no, about his I face? Didn't. Can you describe him? No, ma- matter of fact, I-, I only noticed one thing. What was that? The hat he was wearing. It was a white Panama. I tried to be broad-minded, but there was no other way to look at it. The gentleman in the white Panama hat definitely meant business. I returned to my apartment in Hollywood where I shaved, showered, and packed. And then I headed for Malibu. At a quarter to nine, I was inside the grounds of the Fairchild Estate. Another mile, and I was at the front door. When I entered, Isabel greeted me like I was a keg of brandy around a St. Bernard's neck. Then we waded through an inch-thick carpet to the library where Uncle Avery, fat, bald, and looking like he'd just bitten into an underripe persimmon, was waiting. I wasn't asked to sit down, and I wasn't offered a cigar. Avery Fairchild was not one to waste time. I'm a very rich man, Mr. Marlowe. As such, I'm the target for all kinds of fortune hunters, confidence men, and cranks. In my lifetime, I've been threatened and pestered by a score of crackpots, each one slightly more psychopathic than the last. It's never bothered me, and it never will. However, in this case, the approach is a bit different. Meaning you think somebody's trying to get at you through your nephew, huh? Never refer to him as my nephew. My niece's husband, if you please. And don't forget it. Uncle Avery... Isabel, my feelings about your husband are no secret. You're being unfair, Uncle Avery. Just because Bruce is an artist and he... Artist, is he? By Isabel, that man's no more an artist than I am a horse jockey. Good evening, everybody. Hello, Bruce. Hello, darling. 
You were saying something, Uncle Avery? Bruce, um, I want you to meet Philip Marlowe. We were great friends at school, and when I heard he was in town for a while, I insisted that he spend a weekend with us. How do you do, Mr. Gordon? It's a pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Marlowe. You're very welcome. I do the welcoming around here, Bruce. Uh, Mr. Marlowe's had a long trip, and I'm certain he'd like to turn in early. Bruce, darling, he's going to stay in the guest cottage, the room next to your studio. Will you show him there, please? Oh, I'll be glad to. By the way, Isabella, I'm going to work late, so I'll say goodnight to you now. Good night, dearest. Good night, sweet. Please, please be careful. Yes, Bruce, by all means, be careful. Remember, the true artist belongs to posterity or something. The guest cottage was only a landscape top skip and a jump from the museum that Uncle Avery called home. And as Bruce and I strolled along a flagstone path, I feigned a deep interest in photography. That was all my host needed. He struck at the bait like a shark with malnutrition. Well, Mr. Milo, it didn't even occur to me that photography might be one of your hobbies. Isabel never said a word. Well, good for Isabel. I'm strictly a dabbler. And tell me, Mr. Gordon, how long have you been at this? Portrait work? Mm. Oh, about six months. You see, I divide my time between my studio here and a school I attend in Hollywood. That way, I capture both the theory and practical experience at the same time. Oh. Well, here we are. Would you like to see the studio? Yes, I would. Yeah, let me get the lights. Well, this is all right, huh? And larger, two cameras, dark room. Are these your pictures? Yes. What do you think of them? Uh, I don't know exactly. They're certainly different, huh? They are unusual, aren't they? Yeah. You see, Milo, each picture is actually made up of two separate studies which are superimposed. I call it uh, interpretive photography. Uh-huh. Now, uh, uh, this one, a splash of light and a bent pipe cleaner? The sun and the plant shoot. It's called metamorphosis. Oh. Well, what about that one there in the corner? It's a girl's face and uh, clouds, maybe. Clouds, uh, uh, Mr. Milo, you, you'll excuse me, but that picture isn't ready for display. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry. I thought it was just another interpretive photograph. Well, it's not. That is, it, it isn't finished yet. Now, Mr. Milo, I'm afraid I've forgotten what my wife said about your long trip. Shall I show you to your room? Yes, please do, Mr. Gordon. My room on the other side of the guest cottage was wider than Hollywood Boulevard. After Bruce apologized for his display of temperament and bid me a polite good night, I climbed into the silk pajamas that were laid out for me, stretched out on the bed and tried to figure who belonged to the white Panama hat. About an hour passed, and I wasn't getting any sensible answers. So I switched out the light, put my gun on the table next to me, and snuggled into what felt like a mile and a half of mattress. I was almost asleep, and the clatter of a shovel falling on the walk outside brought me straight up in bed. I grabbed my gun and made for the door. But the second I threw it open, I knew that I'd made a mistake. Whoever kicked over that shovel had heard me, and met me with a large fist that came straight at my face. Oh! As I came back into the world, I was embarrassed to find myself alone and flat on my back. When I started to get up, I felt like the L.A. Dons, water boy and all, had run over my face. My gun was a few feet away, and when I went to pick it up, I stopped short. It was a souvenir from the man with the great big fist. A gold cigarette lighter It was engraved to Skipper on his birthday. Putting it in my pocket, I picked up my gun and made for Bruce's studio. He wasn't there. I threw on some clothes and went back to the house and found Isabel in the living room. I was about to give her a biased account of the shortest fight on record when I noticed Uncle Avery quietly entering the house from a side door that led to the garden. What's the matter, Phil? Bruce isn't in the studio anymore. What? Now, Isabel, there's no reason for alarm. Why, Bruce often goes off into the night like this. Called it a search for beauty or some such rot. And what was it you were after just now outside, Mr. Fairchild? I was looking for my niece, Marlowe. Isabel, the cousin John telephoned to say he wouldn't be down this weekend. Oh, I didn't know there would be other guests. Oh, just my cousin, John Martin, Phil. Not really a guest. He comes down often. Yeah, too often to suit oh, me. Oh, Uncle Avery, please. You know that I'm fond of him. Yes, but I don't know why. He's a chronic gambler and of no use to anyone. Living at the Wilshire Gardens when he can't afford it. 
Driving expensive cars. Oh, you're too hard on him. Skipper is Skipper? Bad. Yes. Do you know him? Uh, no. No, no, I don't. Well, you're not missing anything, believe me. Oh, I do believe you, Mr. Fairchild. I believe your every word. What? Good night, all. I left the house and headed straight for my car with the Wilshire Gardens in Hollywood in mind. It was just a chance that John Skipper Martin might own a white Panama hat. When I got to the prodigal cousin's bungalow, it was dark inside. So I pressed one hand close to my gun and the other against the doorbell. But there was no answer. A side window was open and I started toward it when a nasty voice greeted me from the shadow of a palm tree. Good evening. Lovely night, isn't it? I hadn't noticed. I've been busy. I know. We've been waiting for you for a long time. We? Uh-huh. Me and my nice shiny revolver here. Thirty-eight. Oh, I see. Well, you make a handsome couple and I hope you're both very happy together now. What do you want? I don't want anything. I'm here to give you something. Advice. Look, brother, I've already told you I'm busy, so if this is a heist, let's get it over with fast. You know, I think you're confused. I'm holding the gun, Mr. Martin. Martin? John Skipper Martin. Surprised that I know your name? Why, uh, yes. Yes, I am. I don't recall having had the pleasure. You haven't. People never forget me, Mr. Martin. My tag is Brock. Does that mean anything? No, what do you do? Sing, dance, tell jokes? Yeah, that's it. The last one. I tell jokes. I can't wait. You won't have to, Mr. Martin. I'm going to tell you one right now. It goes like this. Once upon a time, a young punk borrowed $10,000 from a generous gambler on his promise to pay the money back within a week. But the young punk never came across. So the gambler told a nice fellow named Brock to call on the young punk and tell him that he had 48 hours in which to get the money together. And that if he didn't, he'd never see the 49th hour. What's the matter, Mr. Martin? Don't you like jokes? Brock grinned, shoved his 38 into a shoulder holster and walked away. As soon as he rounded the corner, I went to the open window and climbed in. I rummaged through two closets looking for a white Panama you-know-what. I was about to search a third when I heard something that brought me to a dead stop. There was a key in the front door lock. I closed my right hand over the gun in my pocket, moved flush against the side wall and waited. But the moment the door swung open, the telephone rang. And the hulk of a man that entered went straight for it. He was wearing a gray fedora. Hello? Oh, hello, Isabel. What? Bruce? Are, are you sure? But that's impossible. I, I mean, things like that just don't... Excuse me, Isabel. I, I think I have a visitor. I'll call you back. Reach, Mr. Martin. Who are you? The name is Brock. You owe a client of mine $10,000. He wants his money in 48 hours. I'll get it. I, I swear I will. I'll have it right here, on time, all of it. How are you going to do that, Mr. Martin? I, I, I've got a way. Someone's going to give it to me tonight. Why? Why? Oh, because it, it's the healthy thing to do. That's why. That, that's all you wanted to know, isn't it? That's all. Good night, Mr. Martin. <laughs> This is Marlowe, Isabel. I'm calling from a drugstore in Hollywood. Has Bruce returned yet? No, and he won't. He's been kidnapped. What's that? And whoever did it wants $50,000 before morning or we'll never see Bruce alive again. As I walked to my car opposite the Wilshire Gardens, I felt like my brain had spent the night in a cement mixer. I was about to head back for Malibu when I suddenly saw Skipper Martin dash out of his bungalow and pile into a long, glossy convertible. I followed him out to the Pacific Palisades, where he made a call at a little house which sat on a bluff overlooking the sea. Once he was inside, I moved up quietly and saw that the name on the mailbox was Miss Carla Winters. I crawled up to a lace curtain window where I could see what was going on. One look at Miss Winters made the damage I was doing to my tweeds worthwhile. She was strictly dragon lady, with flaming red hair and a waist you could span with two hands. If you were lucky enough to get that close, 
And the rest of the measurements oh, fit yeah. just perfect. Why, you sniveling coward. You wouldn't dare open your mouth about us. Wouldn't I? Listen, Carla, I've got myself Skipper Martin to look after. First, last, and always. You remember that. Why should I? You've always been cheap talk and no more. Look at you now. You're in trouble. So what do you do? You holler blackmail. Go on. Get out of here. Get out of here before I kill you. <laughs> When Skipper slammed the front door, stomped to his car, and roared off, I couldn't figure any reason, legitimate reason, that is, for calling on Carla Winters. So I returned to the Fairchild place. Isabel was somewhere between hysteria and collapse over the fact that she and Bruce had less than $2,000 in their own name. Uncle Avery, of course, was more than reluctant to pay the ransom demanded for the return of a man he'd rather not have returned. But his niece won out. All right, Isabel, I'll give you the money. But understand, I'm doing this for you, not for yes, that no yes, good... Yes, yes, Uncle Avery, I understand. But can you get that much cash at this hour? The banks Who are... said anything about banks? You know, I don't like them. Money will be in your hands in 30 minutes. In the meantime, tell Mr. Marlowe here what arrangements you've made with your husband's abductors. One minute, Mr. Fairchild. What about the police? The police have already been notified, Mr. Marlowe. They've agreed not to interfere until tomorrow morning. By that time, I suppose we'll have Bruce return to us. To... to us, Uncle Avery? Um, that's a mere slip of the tongue, Isabel. I'm only paying for his return. You take over from there. I don't want him. A half hour later, Avery Fairchild handled me a bundle of bills which added up to $50,000 cash. The bills seemed slightly dirty... The old geezer must have had them buried someplace. For a moment, I couldn't help thinking, boy, to get at this place with a shovel sometime. But then I got back to the more pressing matters at hand. I wrapped up the money in a shoebox, and I drove north along the Pacific Coast Highway. I covered the 60 miles to the rendezvous, which was a junkyard near Ventura, in about as many minutes. Then, according to instructions, I slowed down to 10 miles an hour. I blinked my lights twice, tossed out the shoebox... I was just about to resume my speed when the headlights of an approaching car fell on a man as he darted back into the junkyard. And I saw what I'd been expecting all the time. A white Panama hat. But I was still playing by the rules. So there was only one thing I could do about it. I slammed my foot down on the accelerator and kept it there until I reached the nearest telephone where I telephoned Skipper Martin at the Wilshire Gardens. It was just possible that he owned two hats. But that little balloon exploded in a hurry. Hello? Mr. Martin? Yes. Who is this? This is Brock. Remember me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I've been hoping you'd call. You mean you got the money right now? Well, well, well no, not, not, not this minute, but I will have it in a couple of hours. You're sure, Mr. Martin? I'm positive, Brock. <laughs> Now only one thing figured. The man in the Panama hat worked for Skipper Martin. It had to be. An hour later, I pulled in at the Fairchild Estate. And the moment I put my double A over the threshold, I knew that the kidnapper, too, had kept his part of the bargain. Bruce Gordon was back, safe and sound. It happened shortly after you retired, Mr. Marlowe. I was working in my studio when a man wearing a, a white, white Panama, Panama hat... Yes. Yeah. But how did you know that, Mr. Marlowe? They're very popular this season, Mr. Gordon. Darling, Mr. Marlowe was a private detective. Huh? But I'll tell you all about that later. Go on with your story. Well, this man was wearing a handkerchief over his face, and he forced me to go along with him at gunpoint. Took me to a car parked in the service driveway and told me to turn around. And I was hit from behind and went out cold. Oh, darling, how terrible. Oh, it wasn't pleasant to you. When I came to, I was bound hand and foot, blindfolded and gagged. I had no idea where I was. Oh, but didn't you see anybody before you were released? No, Uncle Avery. Before uh, they let me go, they, they hit me again. Uh, when I came to that time, I was lying in the road out near Ventura, untied. That's about it. I suppose you've told the story to the police already, huh? No, he hasn't, Mr. Marlowe. And what's more, he isn't going to. I'm sorry, but I was forced to lie to you earlier this evening. The police mean reporters, and they mean publicity. And I hate publicity. I'm sure you see my point. I wouldn't make book on that, Mr. Fairchild. Secrets like this only encourage kidnappers. Well, since we no longer see eye to eye, Mr. Marlowe, I'd suggest that we consider your services at an end. I'll have my check at your office in the morning. Good night, sir. (laughs) 
Avery Fairchild wasn't the kind of a man you argued with. I threw my coat over my arm, tipped my hat to Isabel, and stepped outside. I hadn't once mentioned Skipper Martin to the family. That might have been a mistake, but I still wanted to look around before I yelled copper. As I walked past the guest cottage, I decided to go in and check Bruce's studio. Maybe the man in the white PH had left a few odd footprints on the ceiling. I tossed my coat in a corner chair and started through the clutter. Uh, ten minutes later, I'd found nothing. I was about to leave when I suddenly remembered the picture of a girl and some clouds that Bruce had been so careful to keep out of sight. Uh, it hadn't been moved. And when I brought it into the light, I didn't have to look twice. <laughs> It was the portrait of Carla Winters, a red-headed dragon lady that Skipper Martin had visited. Now things began to add up. At the chauffeur's quarters, there was an outside telephone, and I put through a hurry call to Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide in L.A. The best I could get was one Sergeant Neely. I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but the lieutenant's out on a call right now. There's some kind of a row uptown. Well, do you know where he is? The address, I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's uh, one of those bungalows at the Wilshire Gardens. The Wilshire Gardens? That's right. What's so special about that? Maybe nothing. I'll know in a minute. Thanks, Neely. Hello? This is Marlowe Ibarra. What brings you to Skipper Martin's at this late hour? Well, it seems as though some person or persons unknown fired a gun several times a little more than an hour ago. Four shots, to be exact. Well, you think Skipper Martin fired them? No, Marlowe. I'm sure Martin didn't fire them. You see, he stopped them. Personally. Before I hung up, I gave Ibarra a quick rundown on the whole story. After making me feel like a schoolboy for keeping him in the dark so long, he told me to sit on the Fairchild's front steps until he got there. Well, it gave me a half hour to kill, most of which I spent walking around aimlessly, trying to get something close to four out of two and two. But I couldn't. Finally, I heard Ibarra siren up to the front door. I was about to head for him when the chill in the morning air reminded me that my top coat was still in Bruce's studio. I went back and got it. When I turned for the door again, I noticed a little slip of paper that had been under the coat fall to the floor. I picked it up. I must have held it for a full minute before I realized what it meant. Just a small slip of paper, and yet it made everything, the kidnapping, call of the murder, fall right into place. <laughs> When I entered the living room at the house, one glance at Isabel and Bruce told me that she'd already knew about Skipper's death. Only Uncle Avery, who was not one to shed crocodile tears, hadn't changed. Ibarra, of course, was unhappy. Marlowe, we can't run any kind of a police department when every private detective acts like he's the commissioner himself. Why didn't you call me when this business first began to smell? You know better. I'm sorry, Ibarra, and I hate to sound immodest, but I happen to be one of the two men in this room who can name Bruce Gordon's kidnapper. And Skipper Martin's killer. You know what you're saying, Marlowe? I think so. The man in the white Panama hat who kidnapped Bruce Gordon, Lieutenant, is Bruce Gordon himself. In other words, Bruce Gordon kidnapped Bruce Gordon. No! What? You're out of your mind, Marlowe. Am I? Would you still say that, Gordon, if we paid a call to Carla Winters and asked her to hand over the $50,000 of so-called ransom money she's holding for you, too? Or would you prefer... Stop, Gordon, stop... The window, he Bruce! <laughs> Then in other words, Marlowe, Bruce, who eventually planned to divorce Isabel and marry Carla Winters, wanted to have a little stake like $50,000 around first. That's right, Ibarra. But Skipper Martin knew about Bruce and Carla's plans to marry later, and he tried to blackmail them to pay off his gambling debts. That's why he came to Bruce's cottage on the sly. However, he got there just in time to see Bruce leave of his own free will and therefore knew later that he couldn't have been kidnapped. Which gave him two holes over Bruce. That's right. But he made a mistake when he went to Carla's house and got too demanding. Because she told Bruce about it, and before he uh, released himself, he took care of Skipper. With four gunshots, to be exact. Charming people, aren't they, Barra? Lovely. Sometimes I think I should shoot higher and save the state a lot of money. And he almost got away with it. Uh, by the way, Marlowe, how do you know that Bruce was the man in the white Panama hat? Well, I was pretty certain, but I got my proof accidentally. Promise not to repeat this, Ibarra? Yeah. Well, I practically fell over a little slip of paper in his studio. It was a receipt from a department store, and it was made out to Bruce Gordon. For one Panama hat? Uh-huh. Nothing else but. Well, 
When I finally got back to my place on Franklin Avenue, the sun was already up. And the people who work at nice, sane jobs were beginning to fill the streets. I'd been on the go for a steady 24 hours, so I could think of nothing but my bed. I was about to put my key in the lock when a next-door neighbor walked by, bid me a cheery good morning, and started down the corridor. Now, that alone wouldn't have disturbed my sleep, but why... Why did he have to be wearing a white Panama hat? The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's story were Jacqueline DeWitt as Isabel Gordon, Wilms Herbert as Uncle Avery Fairchild, Bill Lally as Bruce Gordon, Shep Menken as Skipper Martin, and Lou Krugman as Brock. Detective Lieutenant Abar is played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Be sure to be with us again next week at this same time when Philip Marlowe says... When her will was read, everybody figured she'd been crazy when she wrote it, and that included me. But I changed my mind after spending the night on an island with a pig, a cat, and an ape. Because in reality, they were people. <laughs> For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective, created by Raymond Chandler, brought to you on the air by Pepsodent, and starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with Irium. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. Yes, in a recent test, new Pepsodent was preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three to one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other brand they tried. These families, three to one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, in a recent survey, families three to one said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. Now, the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. <laughs> The moment old man Jeter came into my office, I made up my mind not to vote for him if he ever ran for president. He was tall and thin with straight, compressed white lips. He wore a neat pinstripe flannel suit with a small rosebud in the lapel. He carried an ebony cane. And he wore spats. He looked a smart 60, and unless his ulcers got nasty, I gave him another 15 years, which was pretty big of me. He sat down... Speared me with those barbed gray eyes and came right down to business. Mr. Philip Marlowe, I believe? That's right. My name is Wadsworth Jeter. How do you do, Mr. Jeter? You're a private detective? Well, why not? Frankly, sir, I'd expected the Hollywood detective's office to be somewhat more glamorous or rather more elegant, shall we say? No. Philo Vance has a branch office here on the fourth floor. If you're shopping oh, around... No, no, can... no, no. You'll do, I'm sure. Well, my rate is 25 bucks a day. Plus expenses. Money is no object. Except when you don't have much of it. That seems to be the motivating philosophy where Miss Harriet Huntress is concerned. Who or whom is Miss Harriet Huntress? A rather standard, rather obvious gold digger who wishes to marry Grover. Hmm. 
You want to tell me who Grover is? Grover is my adopted stepson, my late wife's son. Go on. Next year, he will inherit a million dollars left him by his mother. Which explains Miss Huntress's interest in Grover. Precisely. Mm. Look, Mr. Jader, am I being hired to smear Miss Harriet Huntress? Not at all. Merely to disillusion Grover about her. Yeah, well, that's the same thing. I think you'd better find yourself another boy. Wait, wait. There's more. Okay, let's hear it. Do you know a man named Marty Estelle? Sure. He's a big-time gambler out on Sunset Strip. Why? Mr. Estelle claims my son Grover owes him $50,000. Well, then Grover'd better pay up if I know Marty Estelle. But suppose my son doesn't really owe Estelle the money. Does he or doesn't he? Mr. Estelle supplied photostat copies of Grover's notes with Grover's signatures. I thought they might be forged, so without Grover's knowledge, I took them to a handwriting expert named John Arbogast. A sort of detective. No. He's not sure. He wants more time. I... I'd like you to take over the case. Harriet Huntress and all. Miss eh? Huntress, as you may know, is associated with Mr. Estelle. Well, that's incidental. I'll handle the forgery case and not the slander job. Now, where does this Arbogast have his office? On Sunset, near Ivar. Okay, I'll look it up. Miss Huntress? She lives at the El Milano on North Sycamore. Right, I'll look her up, too. Arbogast and Huntress, in the order named. <laughs> There was no snooty secretary to prevent me from walking right into John D. Arbogast's extremely fat presence on Sunset near Ivar. He was an enormously fleshy gent with a thick neck that was in folds like a concertina. He wore a wrinkled dark suit that needed cleaning and some reweaving where it had some small holes in it. Arbogast just sat and stared at me with the whites of his eyes. Because those three holes that needed reweaving were bullet holes. And John D. Arbogast was dead. Very recently dead. I left in a hurry, and as far as I could tell, nobody saw me come, nobody saw me go. My next stop was the Swank El Milano Hotel on North Sycamore. Just a second, mister. Something you want? Yeah. No, who are you? I'm the house detective. Well, I'm looking for a Miss Harriet Huntress. Miss Huntress ain't seeing anyone. You can tell her it's Marty Estelle. Are you Marty Estelle? I'm from him. That's different, ain't it? That's none of your business, is it? Well, whatever you're up to, you're not playing it very smooth. Well, some days I feel like playing it smooth, and some days I feel like playing it like a waffle iron. Well, if you must know, I'm one of the boys. Philip Marlowe, private eye. Here. Here my card. Yeah, well, that's another story. I'll phone up to Miss Hunter. Yeah, uh, say I'm from Marty Estelle, and that make it convincing, huh? Uh, how much convincing? Oh, well, how much do those cigars you're smoking cost you? Twenty-two fifty, box of fifty. That much convincing? Well, that's cute. You and me are going to get along. I'll phone Miss Hunter, but you go right on up. Room 814. I just know it'll be all right. <laughs> Huntress was too tall to be cute, too beautiful to be really cheap. Her green eyes were wide set and there was plenty of thinking room between them. Her hair was a dusky red, like fire seen through a haze. The green eyes were that much green ice as she sized me up in the doorway. Well, what's the big message, Sonny? I'd have to come in. I never could speak very well in public. Come in. Never could speak very well on a dry throat, either. There's the scotch. Help yourself. Thank you. So, you're from Marty Estelle? No, not uh, strictly, not even loosely. <laughs> not at all, in fact. What's your racket? No racket. Marty will love to know you used his name. I'm shaking in my shoes. You're some kind of detective, aren't you? Yeah, right. Philip Marlowe. It's good to got you. I'm glad you like it. Now, what's your business? All right. How much will you take to give up Grover? You look smart, but you talk stupid. Old man Jeter's pretty tough. His idea is that you get nothing. You get smeared. I don't see it that way. How much? How about $50,000? How about $500? How about talking about the effect of the rain on the rhubarb? Now, look, sister. Suppose we skip the footwork, considering the sobering fact that a man named John D. Arbogast has already been murdered in this little case. Does that have anything to do with me? 
I don't know. He was hired to analyze some notes Grover gave Marty Estelle. He was killed just after I took over the case. Do you think Marty Estelle works that way? You know him better than I do, does he? Have you told the police yet? No, I thought I'd see if I could make a deal with you first. I'm going to tell you something. My people were nice people who never got involved in murders. Old Jeter ruined my father. My dad shot himself and my mother died of the shock. I'm going to fix Jeter for that someday. Even if I have to marry his son to do it. And after his stepson really has no relation at all. It'll hurt Jeter just as hard. And the kid will have a million dollars next year. I could do worse. Even if he does drink too much. You wouldn't want Grover to hear that now, would you? No. Turn around and have a look, Gumshoe. I turned fast. He stood about four feet from me. Big, blonde, powerful. Whiskey in his brain and blood in his eyes. <laughs> I can say anything I want around Grover. It's all right with him. Isn't it, Grover? That's right, Harry. He's trying to break us up, Grover. What do you think of that? I think maybe I better break him up. That's what I think of that. <laughs> She laughed, and that made me mad. I turned to growl at her. It was a dirty look. It was the look of the month. That was a mistake. The big guy hit me. I went over sideways. It wasn't a hard punch, but my head hit a desk going down, and the desk got the decision. It gets dark fast in Southern California, but seldom that fast. sucker puncher and Harriet Huntress were gone. But the bottle of scotch was still there, so I took that for a souvenir and stuffed it in my pocket and floated down the elevator into the street. It was dark by the time I got back to my apartment on Hobart Avenue in Hollywood. I turned on the light, and there stood a big guy, another big guy. This was National Big Guy Week. This one had a big nose, the dead color of wax. And he had a twenty-two caliber Colt Woodsman pointed straight at me. Close the door and reach. Come on. I turned a little to close the door. I got my hand under my coat. Then I turned back to Wax Nose fast. I had my luger out. We stood there facing each other. Wax Nose didn't seem at all impressed with my automatic. I uh, just came to tell you to be smart. You're looking at a luger, mister. Yeah, I know. Men of distinction carry Lugers. Me, I pack this small bore because I can shoot. If uh, you think you can take me, go to it. Now, look, what's the game? Uh, maybe you can take a hint and maybe you can. Maybe, maybe not. What is it? Lay off old Cheater's boy. Well, I wouldn't think of contradicting anyone who uses a Colt Woodsman twenty two with the front sight filed off must think he's pretty good. I am good. Yeah. And that's why I say, okay, pal. We'll see. Speaking of 22s, do you know anybody named John Arbogast? Uh, I meet such a lot of people. Well, this one was fat and shot three times with a 22. I don't remember shooting no fat guys today. So long, chum. Remember what I told you. Lay off, Grover. So long, chum. Yeah. Swell. Ah, oh, shut up. Yeah. Mr. Marlowe? Oh, Mr. Jeter. Well, your son or your adopted son or your stepson or whatever he is poked me in the jaw today. He is both my stepson and my adopted son. Well, both of them poked me in the jaw. My word, where? In Miss Huntress's apartment. You spoke to her? What did she say? She wants 50 grand and no dice. I offered her 500. Just as a gag. Just as a gag? Mr. Marlowe, perhaps you underestimate the importance of this matter Listen, to me. Listen, Mr. Jeter, there are some very unusual angles to this case. For example, a gunman just stuck me up in my own apartment and told me to stay off of this case. What? I don't see why this case should get so tough. Good heavens. Listen, Mr. Marlowe, my chauffeur, Waldo, will pick you up in my limousine. I want to talk to you. All right. Well, tell Waldo to park on Hobart facing Franklin. He'll be around for you in 20 minutes. Good. You just give me time to drink my dinner. Bye-bye. <laughs> Big Jeter limousine through Hollywood, along the glitter of the Sunset Strip, 
out past Beverly Hills toward Bel Air. At Cavello Drive, we swung left for a couple of hundred yards and left again, aiming for a driveway flanked by 12-foot wrought iron gates. Then something happened. Someone was standing in the glare of our headlights. Waldo swore and slammed on the brake shelf. You stupid go and get out of the driveway! The man stepped toward us. And the next minute... There was that same Colt 22 staring into my face again. All right, this is a heist. Get out of the car, both of you. Look, Waxnose, haven't you had enough fun for one night? Buzz off, bum. Shut up and get out. I'd have to think some more on that, Buster. I'm warning you, I'll let you have it. Don't be a ghoul, you go. All right, you ask for it. Hey! Holy. You shot the guy. Yeah. I shot him. It was this. All in fun. Uh, yeah, some fun. It did the work. Uh, Jeter's house is right ahead. You there. sound as if you just shot a nickel and a pinball machine instead of a man. Now listen, turn off those lights and let's get out of here, but fast. <laughs> You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. In a recent test, new Pepsodent was preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. Families all over America say new Pepsodent is their favorite three to one. The William Kilpatrick family, 212 South Missouri, Claremore, Oklahoma, preferred New Pepsodent on every single count. The Kilpatricks say New Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer New Pepsodent over any other toothpaste they tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say New Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Kilpatricks and other families who are asked to compare New Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. Get New Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mare, producers of The Romance of Rosie Ridge, starring Van Johnson. <laughs> and I drove back to my apartment again, leaving Waxnose lying dead in the Jeter driveway. We went back to my place to start all over again, over what was left of my purloined scotch. Yeah, this is good scotch you've got here, Marlowe. Pinch bottle. Not this. Sure. I pinched it from the apartment of Harriet Huntress. <laughs> well, bottoms up. Waldo, do you think that gunman was there to scare young Grover into realizing Marty still means business? Could be. I always drove Grover home around that time. Uh, it just doesn't sound like Marty is still to pick that sort of a helper. Well, sure. Maybe that's why he picked him. Because it didn't seem like Marty is still. Yeah. Uh, that's good thinking, Waldo. Dartmouth, 37. Ra, ra, ra. That would be either the cops or Mr. Jeter. Hello. Mr. Mono? Yes, Mr. Dieter, and the reason we're not in your study now is lying outside of your front gate. What's that you're saying? Somebody jumped us outside of your gate and Wallace shot him dead. Good Lord. Yeah. Listen, Marlo, come here at once. Do you hear at once? I'll send Waldo, Mr. Dieter. I want to see you, you. Waldo will tell you all about it, Mr. Dieter. Marlo. Good night, Mr. Dieter. <laughs> After Walter, the chauffeur, had left, I went back to the El Milano Hotel. Hawkins, the house stick, was all smiles and open palms. I placed no confidence in his smile and a $20 bill in his palm. <laughs> Harriet Huntress again? Uh, what's the matter? Just take me up to her apartment, that's all, huh? Yeah, sure. Right this way, fella. Hawkins took me to the eighth floor, room 814, and opened the door. There was someone in the room, waiting. Uh, here's company for you, Mr. Estelle. Beat it, Hawkins. Yeah, this is the guy I was telling you about, Mr. Estelle. Come in earlier today. Said he was from you. Beat it, I said. Oh, sure, sure. Come on in, Marlowe. 
I came to see Miss uh, Hunters, not you, Estelle. Well, first of all, Harriet's not home. I came to tell her what happened outside of Jeter's game. Mm. So you keep informed. I can't wait for her any longer. Got to get back to the casino. Well, then, what did you come back for, Marlowe? I'm looking for the Jeter boy. After what happened to him tonight, he needs somebody to walk behind him. You think I play games like that? All I know is we were shot at. I asked you a question. I answered it to the best of my knowledge. What knowledge, for example? Well, for example, you hold $50,000 worth of Grover's notes for gambling debts. I've got $50,000 invested in the kid. Would I be likely to bump him off? Ah. That makes sense, all right. I always make sense. Oh, bully for you. When I have 50 grand invested in a guy, I'm apt to find out all about him. Like about old Jeta hiring a man named Arbogast to work for him. Ah? Uh -huh. Arbogast was shot today. You know it. I know because I had you followed. You didn't tell the law, Marlowe. That could be very hard on you. Well, it could. Does that make you and me friends? Hmm. A little blackmail, huh? Not much. We'll call it, uh, tattletale grail mail. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, do you stop bothering Miss Huntress? Okay, you win, Marty. Well, that's all. I've got to go. Well, I'll just, uh, wait around for that, okay? Well, Harriet Scotch is in that cabinet there. Thanks, I'll roll up my pants and go waiting in it. <laughs> you know, Marla, I like you. You're cute. <laughs> so long, Chavez. <laughs> Marty Estelle was right. He wouldn't kill anybody who owed him money and was soon to come into a lot of it. Now I was in bed with the police for not reporting Arbogast's murder. Well, I looked around Harriet's apartment vaguely, walked into the bedroom, and stopped. Because mixed with the fragrance of good perfume and good cosmetics was the plain, ordinary, homespun odor of gunpowder. I walked across the room and yanked open the closet door and stepped back. There, just as big as life, but as dead as they ever come, was young Grover Jeter. And at Grover's feet, among the graceful shoes in Harriet's closet, was a tiny pearl-handled automatic. I felt bad about that. Because I guessed that the dainty holes, the bullets from that dainty gun, would fit the two dainty holes over Grover's heart. I put the neat little pistol in my pocket. I, um, I thought old man Jeter ought to know about his son. I thought. I didn't expect to find Waldo, the chauffeur, and Harriet Huntress with old Jeter in Jeter's big study, but there they were. Why, Mr. Marlowe, I'd about given up hoping to see you tonight. Well, I changed my mind about coming out again, Mr. Jeter. Hello, Waldo. Hi, Marlowe. Didn't expect to see you here, Miss Huntress. Didn't you? Did you expect to see me here? Never mind that, Marlowe. I want to know where my son is. What do you mean, Mr. Jeter? He's missing. That's what I mean. Oh. Hmm. He's missing and no one knows where he is. I know. Eh? What's that? Where, Marlowe? Miss Huntress, where did you and Grover go after Grover took that sucker punch at me in your apartment? We went out together in a taxi. During the ride, I had a change of heart. I didn't want Grover or Grover's money. I told Grover to find another playmate, and I got out in Beverly Hills. Grover went on in the taxi. Well, where did you go? Back to my apartment. Later, I got out my car to come down here and tell Mr. Jeter I decided to forget the whole thing. And for him to call off his dime novel sleuth. Well, a dime will no longer buy a novel of any description, but that is beside the point. You said you knew where Grover is. That's not beside the point, is it, Mr. Mallow? He's back in Harriet's apartment. Well, I didn't let him in. How on earth could he be? Hawkins, your house detective let him in. The last I saw of Grover, he was dead. Oh, what? What's that? Dead. Dead. Shot with a small caliber gun. I can't believe it. I, I can't. It's... Grover it's... dead? Miss Huntress, this twenty-five caliber pistol was on the floor at Grover's feet. Here, take it. Look it over, will you? Mine. You murderous. You... I'm not. You, you cold-blooded murderer. Oh, stop that. Stop it, both of you. It could have been suicide. Suicide? Well, yes, that's a possibility, of course. I see you like that idea, Jeter. 
But it wasn't suicide. Then she did it. The murderous, the scheming, contemptible... It was murder, and it's fairly obvious who did it, Jeter. Eh? Uh, Marty Estelle is my guess. Well, guess again, Waldo. Estelle had $50,000 invested in Grover. He wouldn't kill a golden goose like that. And Waxnose didn't do it because he was dead, thanks to Waldo here. That leaves her. She did it. There had to be a motive and an opportunity. Well, it was her apartment after all. Correct, Waldo. But Grover was Jeter's adopted stepson. Oh, like a real son he was to me. A real son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did you lovely people know that in the state of California, a man can inherit from an adopted son who has money and who gets dead? Did you know that, Mr. Jeter? Why, what do you mean? You're inheriting Grover's million dollars would be a motive for killing him, wouldn't it? Mr. Marlowe. That was the motive, Jeter, and it was Waldo's job to find the opportunity to murder Grover for you. All right, Marlowe. That'll be all for you. Well, Waldo, the Dartmouth gun fanner. Huh? Drop that gun, Waldo. Shut up. I said drop it. Oh, drop uh, it. Uh, hey, that's uh, nice shooting, Harriet. My hand, my hand. Now, Pop will put a little Band-Aid on for you, Waldo. Waldo, you could have gotten into my apartment wearing that chauffeur's uniform. Uh, you could have gone in through the garage entrance and up the back way. Sure. When Grover let him in, he backed Grover into the room with his gun, but he shot him with yours. How much was Jeter going to pay you for this job, Waldo? Don't talk, Waldo. He's bluffing. You're telling me he's bluffing. Nice kids, these college boys. Tell me, was it Dartmouth or Danamora, Waldo? Shut up, copper. You killed John Arbogast to throw suspicion on Marty Estelle. Then you hired Waxnose to fake a holdup on Grover. Why? Again, to throw suspicion on Marty Estelle. To make it look as though Estelle was trying to stay, scare Grover into paying his gambling debts. If I hired Waxnose, why would I have shot him tonight? Because you like to kill people, Waldo. When I was brought out here tonight, Waxnose thought I was Grover in the car. He began to fake his holdup. But you just couldn't resist taking one of your snappy snapshots at Waxnose, could you, Waldo? Shut up, could you? Next. Mr. Wadsworth Jeter. Look here, Mano. You you can't accuse me of, of... Doctor, he's sick. Call a doctor. Call a... It's his heart. If Jeter dies, it's your fault, Marlo. Okay, Waldo. Tell you what I'll do, Waldo. If Jeter dies, he doesn't have to pay me my fee. We're even. Okay, Waldo? Harriet Angel, listen, go call a doctor. And uh, while you're there, call the law, huh? <laughs> heart was as good as mine, if you want to make anything out of that. The law had Jeter and Waldo cold, and I mean cold. Me? Well, I went out a couple of times with Harriet, as I sat home with her a couple of times drinking her scotch. It was nice, all right, but I didn't have the money or the clothes or the manners. Still, I was sorry when she went to New York to live. She had absolutely the best scotch I ever tasted. Maybe because it was free. I don't know. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the mystery series Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Van Heflin will return in just a moment. Have you tried, have you tasted the new Pepsodent toothpaste? Its lingering minty flavor is so fresh and inviting, families prefer it by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other toothpaste they tried. In a recent nationwide test, these families said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, new Pepsodent gives you more invigorating irium foam. It sweeps dulling film away. No wonder it's the three-to-one favorite with families all over America. Get new Pepsodent with Arium for your family right away. Now, here is our star, Van Heflin. The need for food in Europe tonight is desperate. Starvation faces a multitude of our fellow men. There's a way you can help. For $10, a package containing 21 and a half pounds of food will be sent for you to a friend or a relative or any member of an organization you designate in Europe. Or simply say to a little French girl or to a Belgian war widow. Your order will be strictly respected and you'll receive a signed receipt from the person who received your gift. Send $10 now. Send all you can. Send your $10 to CARE. C-A-R-E. CARE, New York. 
Help keep America the hope of the world. Tonight's story was adapted by Milton Geiger from the story Trouble is My Business by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at the same time to another exciting mystery on the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. When the will was read, everybody figured she'd been crazy when she wrote it, and that included me. But I changed my mind after spending a night on an island with a pig, a cat, and an ape. Because in reality, they were people. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story... Where there's a will. I had spent the whole day on a noisy job which had concerned itself with a lot of people who talked a lot and said nothing. When I finally locked up my office for the night, I was worn out. As I drove slowly along the street, I was glad to be heading for home and little peace and quiet. At least, that's what I thought. But when I pulled up for a full stop sign, only a half a block from my apartment, something happened which brought my little dream of peace and quiet to an end. The car door opposite me flew open and something mighty excited jumped in. I'm being followed. Drive on, please. The law? No, please drive on. Okay, lady, get a good grip on the upholstery. to do it. Now, what's the... Say, you look a little pale and beautiful. I'm always pale when my heart's in my mouth. Well, then why don't you swallow once, take a deep breath, and tell me who was after you? There isn't much to tell. He was a nasty little man, that's all I know. So thanks for making like Barney Oldfield, and good night. Hey, hey, not so fast. <laughs> it's impolite to hitch and run. Look, mister, right now I'm up to my earrings in trouble, and that leaves very little time for small talk with strangers, even nice ones. Well, in that case, the name is Philip Marlowe, which takes care of the stranger part, and I'm a private detective, which makes trouble my business. <laughs> Where do we go from there? No place. $300,000 worth of hidden bonds, a screwy old lady, and a sculptor with a red beard are too much for any one man police force, Mr. Marlowe. So again, good night. Before I could say anything, she was out and gone. <laughs> there was only the heady scent of taboo in the air. And the memory of a gorgeous profile with jet black hair and pale blue eyes. I sighed like a schoolboy and decided to put her under the heading of things that pass in the night. But I couldn't. Why out of all the cars in Los Angeles should she have picked on mine? Well, the next morning as I was walking down the corridor to my office door, I was still seeing pale blue eyes. Maybe that's why I didn't notice the man who waited outside my door until I was almost on top of him. He was well-dressed and about 35. He looked like a man who had forgotten how to smile. Marlowe. Right. I want to compliment you on your behavior last night, Mr. Marlowe. Barbara told me about it. Oh? Come on in, Mr. Uh... Shields. Edward Shields. Would you be interested in aiding three people in a search for more than a quarter of a million dollars in negotiable bonds? One percent of which will be yours if the bonds are found? Uh, being a fairly fast man with figures, yes. Yes, I would. Splendid. I'd like a few details. Well, Mr. Marlowe, my aunt, Bernice Mayhew Shaw, died, leaving her entire fortune to charity, with the exception of the bonds I mentioned. Those are to be divided equally among three of us, the sole heirs, if we find them within 24 hours. Hmm, that sounds like something you dream about after a midnight snack of pizza and pig's knuckles. Perhaps, but you didn't know my aunt. Beside myself, the beneficiaries are Barbara Haynes, the girl you met last night, she was Aunt Bernice's personal secretary. 
and another nephew, Harlan Crane, who at the moment happens to be a sculptor. Happens to be? Six months ago, he was a sailor. Before that, a <laughs> writer, without even a rejection slip to his name. My cousin is irresponsible, impetuous, and completely self indulgent uh, The will itself, Mr. Shields, what are the exact conditions? At precisely noon today, the three of us are to meet with Luther Willard, my beloved aunt's lawyer, who will give us each a large sheet of tissue paper covered with specific markings. Individually, the sheets mean absolutely nothing. But combined, one over the other, the transparent sheets form a coherent map to the location of the bombs. But uh, why all the intrigue? My... Dear departed aunt had a peculiar sense of humor. In addition to this, she was never particularly fond of any of us. She was sure that our individual shortcomings would make cooperation among us impossible, even for so short a period as 24 hours. And the fact that a man followed Miss Haynes last night convinced you that there was something to that, huh? Convince me? No. He may have been nothing but a purse snatcher. Nevertheless, I do feel that to play safe a fourth party, a custodian of the map, so to speak, would be advisable. That's fine. When do I go to work, Mr. Shields? At noon, at the lawyer's office. However, I regret that first you must be approved by the third heir. I don't like to ask this, Mr. Marlowe, but would you mind very much calling on my cousin, Harlan, personally? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I think he might prove very interesting. Yes. I am sure he will. As interesting as an ape in the zoo. <laughs> felt like saying, look, Shields, I'm not as gullible as I look. But then I thought a client's a client, and I decided to play along. Harlan Crane, six-foot, red-bearded giant, talked as he worked, wielding a ten-pound sculptor's mallet like it was an 18th-century quill. I'll be frank with you, Marlowe. Money isn't everything to me, and never has been. Over a hundred thousand dollars would buy a lot of marble. Half the state of Vermont, I'd say. But come to the point, Mr. Crane, do I get your seal of approval? I imagine you'll be all right. Anyone who can get by Shields, the all-American Scrooge, ought to do. Thanks, a million. I'm not being personal where you're concerned. It's just a matter of facing a fact bluntly. Edward Shields is conniving, avaricious, and dull. I heartily recommend him to nobody. And the girl, Barbara, you feel the same way about her? No, I don't. And the truth of the matter, Marlowe, is that I know very little about Barbara Haynes. But what I do know, I like very much. Yeah, that I can understand. Marlowe, do you realize that once you have the whole map in your possession, you're worth an awful lot of money? Of course I do. The whole map, I have a market value of exactly $300,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, fellow. $300,000, dead or alive. <laughs> I know it was small of me, but I didn't exactly see the joke. And things got less funny as time went on. Later, as me and my trio got off the elevator at the lawyer's office, old Luther Willard, Aunt Bernice's attorney, was waiting for us, so excited he could hardly talk. I... I've been held up. What? what? Uh, a little man. He wanted the map. He a little man? The... Dark complexion? Yes, yes. Had a scar on the side of his neck. How are yet... the maps all right? Hmm? The maps? Oh, yes, yes. They're all right. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, everybody. Give him a chance. Mr. Willard, tell us exactly what happened. Uh, this is Mr. Marlowe. We told you about him, Mr. Willard. Uh, of course, yes, yes. Uh, can I come into my office? Uh, you see, I was putting some papers into my safe when this little man stepped up behind me and uh, demanded the maps. Well, were they in the safe? No, no, thank heavens. Uh, or make yourselves comfortable. The please. maps, Mr. Willard, where are they now? Uh, well, right here, where they were all the time. Here under the blotter on my desk. <laughs> Clever of me, wasn't it? <laughs> Wax seals still intact. I'll take all three of them right now, Mr. Willard. That is, if there are no objections. <clears throat> all right, then I guess we can be on our way. Hold on, Mr. Marlowe. There are still two things you people must know. First, in the event the bonds are not recovered within the 24 hours, I am instructed to open another sealed envelope, which I am happy to report is kept in my bank vault. That envelope contains a complete and simplified map and is to be turned over to a designated charity. And second, if any of you die before the allotted time is up, the bonds are to be divided among the surviving persons. And if none of us survives, Mr. Willard... Why, in that case, the bonds again go to charity. You see, Harlan, your aunt was a very generous woman. After.
after arranging to meet with the three heirs at Shields Place later that afternoon, I headed for the nice and public public library where I figured I'd be able to examine the maps in safety. By placing the three maps exactly one over the other, I saw that the bonds were hidden on the larger of two squares of land called Twin Islands, which were the personal property of the late Bernice Mayhew Shaw, and located in Indian Lake in the San Bernardino Mountains. As I left the library with the three maps in my pocket, I, I felt like a well-fed mallet on the opening day of hunting season. And then I knew I was being followed. As I slipped into a doorway and turned, I saw it was the nasty little man with a scar. All right, you, we're through playing tag. Oh, uh, let me go. Not yet, shorty, not until you talk loud and clear. No, no, don't hit me, please. Please hit me down, I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. All right. If you're sure you can get it all straight the first time, there. Now, the whole story, beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Yeah, like you say, whole story. Okay. Starts. Like this! By the time I figured out that it had been the sawed-off end of a broomstick that had slammed my stomach up against my backbone, the little man was out of sight. Another five minutes went by before I quit calling myself sucker and I started to think straight. Nearest public locker was in the Santa Fe Trailways bus depot on Cahuenga. I went up there and deposited two-thirds of the map for safekeeping until we were ready to leave for Indian Lake. And I found a telephone, and a half a dozen calls later, I knew that a caretaker named Jumbo was the sole inhabitant of Twin Islands. And my last call was to him. I wanted some kind of a welcoming committee ready for us. When I left the phone booth, it was only one o'clock. So I returned to my apartment where I figured I'd rest until three, when we were all to meet at Shields Place. But that was my second mistake. Because the moment I closed my apartment door, I was positive I wasn't going to get much rest. I had an unannounced visitor. Yeah, you look surprised, Mr. Marlowe. I am. I didn't recognize you at first without your broomstick. Yeah, I traded that in on this twenty-two target pistol here. It's more expensive, but it's better. Makes me as big as you are. Maybe bigger. Yeah, but how much does it do for your personality? Quite a bit. Gives me poise. And poise gives me manners. So in asking for that map in your pocket, I'll even say please. Come on, Milo, I won't say please twice. No, I don't think you would. Here. Thank you. Now, before I go, one more thing. The hall outside here is straight and narrow, right to the stairs, and that makes it fine for shooting. So after I step out, don't do anything rash. For a while. So, loving life as I do, I didn't do anything rash for a while. In fact, I could have whipped up a nice seven-minute frosting before I moved at all. And I phoned the three heirs to get together at my apartment. When I finally had them all seated in front of me, I related the saga of the little man. Including my premonition that one of the three present was signing his paychecks. Of course, I got nothing but Cupid doll innocence out of any of them. So after adding that we'd get underway just as soon as the missing one-third of the map was returned to me, I threw my trench coat over my arm and told them I was going for a walk. But before leaving them, I reminded them that whoever was behind the little man could fire him, because I would never have kept all three maps in one place anyway, unless all of the heirs were on hand to watch one another. And then I left. I hadn't walked more than a half a block up Franklin when I stopped at the sound of Barbara running after me. Phil, I'm scared. Harlan and Shields are acting like a couple of wild men, calling each other every name under the sun. What'd you expect? Chit-chat about the weather? I quit acting like a bobby sock, so within squealing distance of Sinatra and try a cigarette. It'll calm your... Well, what is it, Phil? Why are you smiling like that? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, Barbara, nothing. <laughs> it's just that I found this in the pocket of my trench coat when I went for my cigarettes. It's the map. That's right. It's the missing third. It's back already. <laughs> When that missing third part of the map turned up so fast, I figured the heirs had decided to play ball. But I made a mental note to keep my eyes on them anyway. At three o'clock, I went to Edward Shields' hillside house in Laurel Canyon for the scheduled meeting. Shields wasn't home yet. 
But Cousin Harlan was there, admiring the view. Barbara showed up a few minutes later in a convertible, and Shields arrived last by cab. It finally began to look as though we might actually start out all together. Well, I see we all arrived safe and sound. Yeah, disappointed. Only by your clumsy attempts at humor, Harlan. Stop it, boys. Let's get started. Phil, have you looked at the map? Where are we going? To Indian Lake. It's a four-hour drive, so if you're all ready, I suggest we get started. Very well. I'll go up to the garage and get the car. So Aunt Bernice hid the bonds in a roost at Twin Islands, eh? Well, well, well. Nobody seemed surprised at the location Aunt Bernice had chosen to hide her bonds. And Holland, Barbara, and I stood on the front porch watching Shields as he climbed the very steep driveway to his garage in the car. But Barbara got more of my attention than Shields. Ah, she made a mighty dreamy picture. And she leaned casually back against the rail of the porch. She wasn't aware that I was watching her. And I suddenly saw her go tense, her eyes filled with fear, and I quickly turned to follow her stare. Shields' car was going at a rapid clip down the steep driveway. I still couldn't figure out Barbara's concern, and then she started screaming. The car's out of control. The car was headed for the edge of a cliff. His brakes are out. He'll go over. The tree. The tree stopped him. Shields. Are you hurt? No, no, I'm... All right, the, the brakes. I, I tried to stop you. You hadn't hit that tree. You'd have gone over the edge. Let's have a look at those brakes, Shields. Well, no wonder. What is it? Brake line's broken. Every drop of fluid drained out. I might have been killed. No might about it, Shields. We stood there for a while, all looking at one another, but nothing was said. Brake lines rarely snap accidentally. And I remembered that Harlan had been at Shields' house early... And the car had been in the garage, and Barbara... Well, I had to admit that she actually had anticipated the car going out of control. Well, the 24 hours for finding the bonds were slipping by, and I knew we had to get to Indian Lake. We held a short power without passing the peace pipe, and we decided to take Barbara's car. We picked up the rest of the map, which I checked at the bus station, and we shoved off. After a four-hour drive that was about as relaxing as the thought of an overdue time bomb in a day nursery, we finally pulled up to the shores of Indian Lake. Jumbo, the caretaker, was waiting at the dock. He knew how to handle a boat, and a few minutes later we could see Twin Islands. We headed for the smaller of the two where I could make out a rambling lodge. The other island, a quarter of a mile away, seemed deserted. Shields was the first one ashore. Here, Barbara, let me help you. Run along, boy. I'll help Barbara. <laughs> Thanks, Harlan. Well, Marlo, what now? Well, first we go up to the house. Oh, Jumbo, you got everything ready for us? Hey, Jumbo. Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure, everything's ready, Mr. Marlo. It's like you said, I opened four of the upstairs rooms. Open the rooms? We're not going to sleep out here, are we? I'm going to try. But this isn't a vacation. We're here to find the bonds and get out. You realize it's almost nine already? That leaves us just 15 hours, Marlo. Yeah, I know. I got a good watch and I count to 24 and I'm also giving orders to Don't you three. Don't get high-handed, Marlo. You're an employee of ours, and that's all. Let's get the map together and start looking for those bonds right now. Take it easy, big man. The bonds are hidden on the other island. The map is as tangled as a second-hand spider web. We wouldn't get anything at all down in the dark. That's your opinion. Look, you I... people hired me to help you find those bonds. If I have to get nasty to make you take orders, I can do that, too. Now, let's play like we're smart and go up to the lodge and relax. All right, Marlo. But remember, we'd better have those bonds by tomorrow, or someone else will be nasty. Very nasty. And I mean me. What? You too? Getting the three heirs settled down at dinner table was quite a chore. And when I was sure they'd keep an eye on each other, I slipped outside. I hid one third of the map in a drain pipe. Then I went upstairs to my room and I hid another third in the window shade. Now the maps were settled and I began to think about other things like... Like the accident to Shield's car... There were too many accidents and coincidences to suit me. So I decided to drop in on Cousin Holland's room to see what I could see. After 15 fruitless minutes, I was about to leave when... something in the wastebasket caught my eye. A corner of a half-hidden handkerchief monogrammed H.C. I had just picked it up when I saw Jumbo standing in the open door. A handkerchief there in your hand. That blood on it. No. Now, it looks more like brake fluid. And in this case, it's practically the same thing, huh? 
I think we'll leave it right here in the wastebasket, Jumbo. Oh, did you want something? Just wanted to say I'll be in my own place out back if you want me. Okay. You know where Mr. Shields is? He's out in the veranda. Alone? Yeah. Thanks, Jumbo. If I need anything, I'll call you. Good night. Shields. Oh. Oh, it's you, Marlowe. What's wrong? You sound like a man expecting trouble. <laughs> I was nearly killed in my car this afternoon, and I don't think that was the end of it. Yeah, and don't stand too close to high windows. Thank you. It's comforting to know that I am not alone in my suspicions. Maybe, uh... How are you betting? On the beauty or the beast? Don't be absurd. I hope someday to marry Barbara. Yeah? Well, a guy might be beating your time right now with a sculptor's mallet. You may be naive, Mr. Marlowe, but Barbara isn't. I saw them just a moment ago walking down to the boathouse. Harlan's galloping after her like a half-baked idiot, as usual. But if Miss Haynes prefers me, what can he do about it? There was an answer for that, but it seemed a little obvious under the circumstances. But a few minutes later, Shields went inside, and I made a beeline for the boathouse to water down a certain hot-headed sculptor named Harlan. When I got within earshot, I knew I'd be as welcome as whooping cough at a glassblower's convention. So I stopped and listened. Barbara, darling, I'm falling in love with you. You know that, don't you? Let me hold you close. Harlan, I... Oh, Harlan. This is real, Barbara. For the first time in my life, I'm truly in love. I want to do things for you, make you happy. Please wait. I'm not completely free. There are still ties with Edward, you know. Shields. That fat, stingy Babbitt. He's no man for you. Why, if he so much as touches you from now on up... Wait a minute, Barbara. Marlowe, you cheap snooping ears up of this... He's some minor vice compared to some of the shenanigans going on around here. Just what do you mean by that? A word to the wise is sufficient. You, I'll give a few more. Now, somebody's trying to cut our little triangle down to two sides before noon tomorrow. What I've seen so far, I don't like, so I'm warning everybody. Just what are you accusing me of? Well, Harlan, stop it. Don't be a fool. Will you cavemen control yourselves until those bonds are found? Come on, Harlan, let's go in. Good night, Marlowe. Don't get your head caught in any transoms. Deciding sleep wouldn't be very healthy for a man in my position, I decided to sit up that night. And it was about two o'clock when I looked out the window and saw something mighty interesting. A light was moving on the other island opposite us. I got hold of John Moore and we went over there as fast as we could. Uh, there we're beach. That light's dead ahead, Mr. Marlowe. Looks to me like it's up in the picnic shelter. Yeah, I'll see you later, John Moore. Guess who? Oh, Marlowe. I didn't hear you come up. Wind's too strong, I guess. I'm glad to see you. Spooky here all alone. Oh, sure, sure. What's the idea? Decide to do a little freelance prospecting? Oh, that's right. Bernice Mayhew loved this spot. And I had a hunch she hid the bonds here in the base of this table. Oh, I guess I was wrong. Oh, come on, Marlowe. Limber up. You can't blame me for trying. Listen, beautiful. Don't flap your eyelashes at me. I can't see anything but double crosses right now. All right, if you've had your fun, let's go back to the lodge, Don't huh? be that way, Phil. Phil, the sun will be coming up in two or three hours. Why not wait for it here with me? Barbara, baby, don't burn up too many calories with that routine. Because I only keep one-third of the map on me. You think you're so smart. Bright ideas hatch in that cute little brain of yours, too. Now let's... Oh, Comes the gun with a pearl handle, no less. Stay away from me, Marlo. Over there. Hey, what's going on here, Eddie? Jumbo! Look out, Jumbo! <laughs> Jumbo stepped into the light and Barbara turned. I made a swipe at a gun hand that knocked pistol person lamp all over the picnic shelter. I found the gun and gave it to Jumbo. Then I started to pick up an assortment of knickknacks that had spilled out of her purse. But I never finished. Because one of the items made my eyes pop. It was the monogrammed handkerchief covered with brake fluid that I'd found in Holland's room. It all made sense now. It tied up everything that I'd suspected right along. Only two of my trio had planned to split up the $300,000 worth of bonds from the first. As I ran for the motor launch, I yelled at Jumbo to bring Barbara over in the rowboat. All the way back, I had the panicky feeling that I was probably too late. 
But when I sneaked in the front door of the lodge, there were still two voices. And they came from the open kitchen door. With my hand on my gun, I edged along the wall and peeked in. Seals, you're a fool. Perhaps. But I'm going to kill you and have a perfect case of self-defense. What are you talking about? Your hopelessly framed cousin, Harlan. I ruined the brakes on my own car. I planted your handkerchief, stained with brake fluid in your room. Marlowe found it. He's convinced that you tried to kill me. He's also convinced that he was brought into this whole thing by coincidence. He doesn't know that he was deliberately involved in our search for the bonds, just so he'd make a reputable witness. You're out of your mind. Not at all. I'm going to kill you and say it was self-defense. Marlowe will testify that you tried to kill me before. What Marlowe's going to do is blow your head off if you don't drop that gun, Shields. Marlowe. Yeah, Marlowe. Who knows he wasn't brought into this thing by coincidence, but has stuck around to see the fireworks and who almost saw them just now. Bill, what's happened? Barbara, couldn't you hold Marlowe on the other island? You shut up, Shields. Barbara's little mistake was that she should have gotten rid of Holland's handkerchief after she took it out of his room so he wouldn't see it. Barbara, I don't understand. You you planned all this with Shields against me? I did in the beginning, Harlan, but I changed my mind when I fell in love with you. I, I let Marlowe find the handkerchief in my purse. I-, I wanted him to stop, Edward. Oh, darling, don't you Come see... Come on, Miss Bankhead, cut the dramatics. The show's over. Let's have it straight, huh? All right. We might as well if we're going to find those bonds before it's too late. Edward and I did plan it. We even hired the little man who tried to get the maps from you. And when that didn't work, you planned to get rid of Holland and split the 300 grand. So we failed. So what? We're right back where we started. A hundred thousand apiece. Now, let's go find those bonds. Not so fast, beautiful. What happened to Harlan just now was a little more serious than a hot foot. It was attempted murder. He can slap you two in the jug this minute if he wants to. But I'll leave it up to him. Okay, Harlan, what do you say? It's your move. No. I've got a better idea. Marlowe, one third of that map is mine. Give it to me. Okay. There it is. Harlan. What are you going to do? Harlan, no. Don't burn it. There. Now we all lose. Now none of us will get the bonds. That's probably how Aunt Bernice wanted it anyway. It was almost noon. I was standing on the veranda of the lodge, and a scrawny old crow was perched up on the roof. I saw Barbara and Shields quietly pull away in a boat with Jumbo, and I saw Holland lumbering off to the far end of the island to sulk. And as I watched the three of them, I couldn't help thinking. A pig in a pinstripe suit, an ape with a red beard, and an alley cat in nylon. Keep laughing, Aunt Bernice, you were right. Greed, treachery, and rashness don't mix. Even for 24 hours. And the 1% of the bonds I was to get? Well, that's my contribution to charity. Who knows? Maybe I can take it off my income tax. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's story were Mary Ship, Parley Bear, Don Diamond, Ted Von Eltz, and Wilms Herbert. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard Orant. <laughs> I got the crisp $50 bill in advance. I figured my client had a heart of gold. But after I was beat up, double-crossed, and shot at, I realized just how hard a heart of gold could be. Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, John Dixon Carr, three great names in the world of mystery and thrills. One down, two to go today on CBS. Now that you've heard Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe in action, CBS invites you to hear Dashiell Hammett's Sam Spade in action tonight, followed by John Dixon Carr's personally written radio series, Cabin B-13. Chandler, Hammett, Carr, today and every Sunday, over most of these CBS stations. It's a mystery if you miss them. (laughs) 